Good evening, everyone. This is Danny Hai Fong. You are tuning in to a very special uh, late night edition of The Left Lens. I'm uh, just going to let YouTube catch up a bit. Uh, but uh, welcome, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. In just a minute, I'm going to introduce our guests. But while you're coming in, of course, uh, the best thing you can do is like this stream. Uh, like the stream. Uh, be sure to do that because that helps boost the algorithm, gets more people in to the stream so more people can see uh, our special guests and what they have to say and of course hit that subscribe button hit that notifications bell and the best way you can support the channel is on patreon at patreon.com slash danny high fong so if you've been following what i've been covering over the last several days you know that nancy pelosi is likely on her way to taiwan in the next 24 hours and this has gotten a lot of attention from China. It's gotten a lot of attention in the Western media, in the U.S. media. There's been a lot of warnings given by China uh, about this. It's a very provocative move. It's one that uh, the Biden administration says it doesn't agree with, but has refused to take any more measures other than say that it doesn't agree with the trip. But the point about this is, is that it's, it's a huge move. It's a huge violation of the one China policy. And I wanted to get a couple of guests here today who have who are friends of the show, have been on the show before, who know a lot more about Taiwan than I do and about cross straits relations, about the context that we need to know in order to understand what is going on right now. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Carl Za. He is the host of the Silk and Steel podcast and Xiang Yu, who is a Marxist, Taiwanese, Chinese rapper, a Marxist Leninist. Welcome, guys. Welcome. Hello, Hi. everybody. <laughs> well, here we are. We uh, are uh, probably hours, if not less than a day away from Nancy Pelosi's infamous trip. It's gotten a lot of attention in the media. Uh, there are a lot of concerns about this. China's foreign ministry ha it has repeatedly voiced these concerns, has talked about taking very intense countermeasures should Pelosi actually seek to complete this trip to Taiwan. And so I wanted to have you guys on because I think that it's time to really tell the truth about cross straits relations, about the U.S.'s role, about uh, how uh, China and Taiwan uh, all relate to this very provocative move. So first, I want to get to let's start with you, Xiang Yu. Uh, your reactions. I want to get both of your reactions to this trip that Pelosi is said to be taking. It's not clear whether she'll actually go, but uh, anonymous officials, uh, both in Taiwan and in the United States, say, which usually that means intelligence, say that she's going and she's going to take her congressional delegation with her overnight in, on August 2nd. So, Xiang Yu, your reactions. Um, it's alarming. It's not surprising. It's um, it's not surprising given the current um trajectory of DPP policy as well as the policies of the Democratic Party in context with the fact that the midterms are coming up and Nancy Pelosi is the main fundraiser of the party, and just the ri also the rising Sunni U.S. tensions, and we'll get into more details on this later. But I, my guess as to whether or not she will be going to Taiwan is as good as yours. But um, she did like leave Taiwan out of that statement. So, you know, with like the other with like the countries that she's visiting, like, you know, so it does appear that there is a possibility that she will be meeting at least on an unofficial in an unofficial capacity with NGOs. But it, it's hard <laughs> to say. We'll find out. Well, after um after her statement uh there's actually a, a taiwanese news reporter who reported according to her sources um that <clears throat> pelosi will indeed make a stop by in taiwan um as early as tonight uh tonight uh here here's time so so basically your your time tomorrow morning you will we will find out whether uh, Nancy Pelosi will actually land on Taiwan or not. And there's a uh, there's also Taiwanese uh, media has reported uh, Pelosi's team already booked 48 hotel rooms in Taipei. And 
what I wanted to point out is that there has been a lot of disinformation from the United States government around this visit. You know, we have the speaker, we have the White House uh, uh, spokesman, John F. Kirby, who uh, went on record and saying, there's no reason for Beijing to turn a potential visit consistent with longstanding U.S. policy into some sort of crisis. Again, this is uh, shifting the blames onto China, right? And, and it's making China the aggressor. The, the point is, it's not U.S. longstanding policy to send Speaker of the House, you know, the, the person who is second in line to succeed the U.S. presidency in case something happened to Biden, to, to Taiwan. In fact, the, under Donald Trump's administration in 2018, they had to pass a law to allow it. The, uh, under Donald Trump, they passed the Taiwan um, Travel Act which allow high level U.S. officials to travel to Taiwan. So what we're hearing currently from our government, from the United States government, is a bunch of lies around this uh, visit. This, this visit has, um, I mean, this is a symbolic, symbolic visit, so sort of show support to the current uh, government in Taiwan. But what does it actually do? What, what's the actual impact? Right now, there's peace across the Taiwan Strait. Pel Pelosi's visit is designed to instigate tension. And the United States government and their government official wasn't shy about uh, pointing this out. As late as um, uh, last year, the U.S. Uh, uh, US diplomats in Taiwan, uh, because the U.S. do not have official relationship with Taiwan because the United States do not recognize uh, 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 the government on Taiwan officially. So instead, what they have is what is the so-called American Institute on Taiwan. So the deputy head of the American Institute on Taiwan, Raymond Grain, in a speech in Taipei, said last year that U.S. no longer sees Taiwan as a problem in the China ties, and in fact. Uh, you, this is what this is his exact words. United States no longer sees Taiwan as a problem in our relations with China. We see it as an opportunity to advance our shared vision for free and open Indo Pacific. So, in other words, the United States have decided in the recent years that it's going to use Taiwan as a palm, as a, 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 as a chip in to play with its, uh, within the Sino-US relationship. And, and it's designed to use Taiwan as a point to instigate tensions. And that's what we're seeing today. Yeah, yeah. Well, you said the word chip. And I think that's a, a good segue for you, Xiangyu. I want to ask you about this because when there's war, when the US is provoking war, there's always money behind it, whether it's a military industrial complex or... Uh, what is the critical tech infrastructure, uh, the tech sector, which Taiwan is a big player in, and China, of course, we know is a huge player in. Uh, could you talk about chips? Could you talk about the, the what what could, you know, we know that Nancy Pelosi is a huge Silicon Valley. Uh, 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 she, she receives huge donations from Silicon Valley, is deeply ingratiated in big tech. Uh, and we know that there are economic interests behind this because I think we should get into Carl definitely started us off on like why Taiwan, why now? Uh, I think there's a long history to this, but can we talk? Can you talk a little bit about the economic uh, interests behind this? Well, imagine if you were Saudi Arabia and you know that the price of oil per barrel is going to go down to. Um, Ten dollars per barrel that would be a cause for alarm right and um right now um and right now there's there's multiple there's multiple reasons one is um tsmc and i, I want to start off with a fun fact did you know tsmc gained its relevance in the in the 21st century because of a mistake at intel somebody in a, in a spreadsheet Essentially, Apple was shopping around for processors for its iPhones. And um, before you before you go on, just uh, uh, spell out TSMC so people know uh, what that is. Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company is that it? 
I, I call it Tai Chi Dian. <laughs> Is that what it stands for? Carl, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. No, 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 I mean, you got the you got the name right. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. okay, yeah. <laughs> I think of it in Chinese like Tai Chi Dian. Anyways, um, fun fact. Um, Apple initially went to Intel to um get the um chips for its iPhones, and they were shopping around for chips, but somebody messed up the spreadsheet at Intel and quoted I think double the price. So they ended up going with ARM and Qualcomm, and they got their chips fabbed at TSMC. And right now, um, TSMC is basically the only thing Taiwan's economy has going for it. Um, you know, Taiwan's basically deindustrialized ever since um, the normalization of, um, well, not, yeah, normalization of trade between Taiwan and the mainland um, ever since, you know, the 80s and 90s. Manufacturing jobs and all that have slowly but surely all moved to the mainland and elsewhere at this point. Um, and it's kind of leveraged that to its advantage because it's two major destinations have always been mainland China and the United States. And the Taiwan administration in recent years have been, um, you know, doing chip sanctions and causing artificial shortages to gain some political leverage. And... This is where they might have miscalculated because the way if you're mainland China's mentality ever since reform and opening up is if we can buy it, we buy it. If we can buy it and other people make it better, we buy it. But if somehow we can't buy it, then we're going to start figuring out how to make it very well. So you see the problem here. Now, um, the United States has invested, I believe, um, $100 billion into chips and mainland China, in turn, has invested, I think, $52 billion. It's a total of $152 billion in chip fab. And by 2024, TSMC is going to be surpassed. It's going to lose all this leverage. It's going to lose its economic leverage. And there's going to be an um, oversupply of chips. And that is when a recession in Taiwan is going to hit. And um, the DPP is kind of preparing for that because... In order to maintain um, political stability, you need a certain level of economic stability. But absent of that, what else can you play? Uh, I just want to point out that the, the, the whole chip issue was uh, instigated by U United States. Because as, uh, as uh, Xiang Yu mentioned before, China was perfectly happy to source its chips from Taiwan. It has, yeah, in fact, it has been done so for the past several decades. And what you uh, what United States under uh, Donald Trump has said, you know, no, China, you cannot buy chips anymore. We're going to sanction you. We're going to we're going to have a chip blockade against China. And it, 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 it prohibits United States uh, U.S. company from sourcing chips. Uh, and you also um, you try to kill the, the Chinese chip domestic chip manufacturing. So it even prevents a U.S. company, not only prevents U.S. companies and Taiwan company. You know, Taiwan is not part of the United States, but U.S. laws would sanction Taiwan company if they continue to sell chips to, to China. So with this uh, chip sanction on China, uh, the Donald Trump also um, imposed a ban on U.S. company from buying chips manufacturing in China. So even U.S. companies in China like GM, you know, GM manufacture cars in China sell to the Chinese domestic market. In fact, the GM sells more cars in China than they sell in the United States. But those GM cars cannot use, buy chips, for manufacture on mainland China because of U.S. law. So this is, this is you, how U.S. government policy created artificial chip shortage. And then, um, then U.S. is forcing the TSMC, the Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, to divulge your trade secret, uh, to share them with the U.S. companies, and 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 U.S. is trying to build up its own manufacturing uh, chips domestically in U.S. So so in case of a conflict that does break out between in the Taiwan Strait, U.S. chip supply will not be affected. So so U.S. have been this plan has been set in motion a long time ago. Um, well, you know this is not something that. Nancy Pelosi's uh, last minute visit just started to spark this tension. In fact, as of 2021, U.S. military spy planes had sent out 1,200 sorties over South China Sea. That's 1,200 sorties over South China Sea. Um, and, and, you know, Biden acts like as if uh, 
you know, he cannot do anything about stopping uh, uh, Pelosi's visit, which is entirely bogus because Nancy Pelosi is traveling on U.S. government asset. <laughs> and as a commander in chief, Biden could easily say, no, you know, you cannot travel. You cannot travel on this U.S. government asset. You know, the U.S. Air Force will not provide cover for you. And, and you know, you can, you have to travel on commercial planes. But this is not this is not what's happening. And in conjunction with uh, Pelosi's visit to Taiwan, now U.S. military has deployed many assets in the yeah. surrounding area. We have uh, a nuclear propulsion aircraft carrier group, uh, the, the USS, um, I think this is USS Roosevelt, uh, that's stationed uh, right between Philippines and Taiwan at this moment. And, and then U.S. has forward deployed to what they call amphibious landing assault ships. Now, this amphibious landing assault ship is just a rename, another name for light aircraft carrier because uh, U.S. Congress has passed a law putting a maximum cap on how many aircraft carrier U.S. have. So they just changed the naming convention to call these uh, smaller aircraft carrier landing uh, amphibious landing assault ships. So U.S. have a, a two additional uh, these landing assault ships that's based in Okinawa and in Japan. So right now they have the U.S. have multiple. Basically, U.S. have multiple aircraft carrier groups right now stationed all around Taiwan. And as we spoke yesterday, uh, the U.S. Navy, uh, U.S. Navy spy planes has been uh, both U.S. Navy and U.S. Air Force spy planes. Um, and anti-submarine surveillance plane have been spotted to the southwest of Taiwan Strait. So there's a lot of activity. It's not like the, you, you, Nancy Pelosi's visit was this spontaneous uh, effort on her own part. You know, this is well coordinated. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it's it's pretty obvious she's going on military aircraft. It, it wouldn't be the first time. That someone like Lloyd Austin, the Secretary of Defense, would uh, try to get the president or get a prominent politician to do something that was in the best interest of the national security state. And it would seem that verbally, rhetorically, the national security state is saying, oh, yeah, this could be a little this could be kind of dangerous. Maybe it's not worth it. But they're not willing to do anything in terms of actually enforcing that belief, which uh, uh, it, given the extremely i mean just this back and forth that we've had over the last several days where the information was leaked that pelosi was going then you had biden with his very short statement you had the pentagon give statements a short statement to the media then you had pelosi saying the trip was tentative the congressional delegation to taiwan would be tentative and then you know 24 hours <clears throat> within the last 24 hours saying you had all these anonymous sources and officials uh, telling the media that no it's actually happening and then and and so the way that this has gone about feels like there's a significant section of the U.S. elite that want this and that want this for many different reasons. You guys outlined the economic reasons and some of the sort of more militarist reasons. Can maybe I'll kick it back to Shang Yu and, and Carl definitely uh, jump in. Can we let's can we talk about the basis for the one China policy? Because this is what is angering China so much about this trip. They repeat, you know, foreign ministry, uh, Xi Jinping said it in his call to Joe Biden on the 28th, repeatedly talking about the one China principle, that this was something that the U.S. and China agreed to. It's, follow, you know, international law. Uh, basically, the United Nations recognizes this. Can you talk about the basis for this and... It, it may be in, in, in the most basic terms to begin because you see some of the media chatter. Uh, you mentioned John Kirby, <coughs> Carl's uh, talking the way he was. Uh, you, see US, you see U.S. politicians on both sides of the aisle, but especially on the Republican side, kind of not even pay attention to this. This is like very critical uh, part of history. Could you talk about what the basis for this policy is? Why is it important? Why does China see this as its red line? Any country has its own red line and its own, own sovereignty thing. The, co the thing that complicates the matter of um, the China issue is there, as you as you as you may know, there was a civil war in China that ended in 1949 with um, the old 
the remnants of the old government, the which was the Republic of China, um, losing the rest of China, losing mainland China, and only having Taiwan, uh, Jinmen, Mazu, Jinmen and Mazu are two islands off of the coast of um, on the other side of the Taiwan Strait. And um, the thing is, both um, both governments agree that there is one China. They just disagree on what that China is. Now, obviously, this. This um, claim that the so-called Republic of China is a legitimate government of all of China is no longer actively pursued and hasn't been taken seriously since 1980, but it's kept there because it is a point of unity between the Taipei and the Beijing, um, the Taipei administration and the Beijing government. The point of unity is, hey, we're one family, we have a disagreement, but our point of unity is this is one country. And um, some people in the West might have this understanding, saying, oh, this means like Taipei is like... Um, reactionary because oh, well it is but not for this reason Be because it's like it's claiming all of china when it only controls this so it's the aggressor actually um from the perspective of beijing if the administration on taipei drops the claims over the mainland then it sees it as a move towards a formalization of a two china situation or a taiwan independence situation which to beijing is the same thing but funnily enough in taiwan to china and taiwan independence mean different things but they're still fundamentally the same so how is taiwan a part of china well i mean it became it became integrated into china and um formally and during the qing dynasty like long before long before the united states ever existed so um and china's ex and the fact that Taiwan has been estranged from the mainland for a few decades is a drop in the bucket in Chinese history, because like we think of history like in in, in centuries and like in like out of five thousand years, so Taiwan was returned to Japan like this. Oh, well, Taiwan was ceded to Japan in eighteen ninety five following the defeat of the Sino Japanese War, and and uh, Japan was de defeated in nineteen forty five. And um, there was, it had to agree to the terms of the 1943 Cairo Declaration, which reads, all the territories of Japan that have been stolen from Ch Chinese, such as Manchuria, Formosa, which is Taiwan, the Pes Pescadores, which is um, Penghu, shall be restored to the Republic of China, an excerpt from the 1945 Potsdam Declaration. Japanese sovereignty shall be limited to the islands of Honshu, Hokkaido, Kyushu, Shikoku, and such minor islands as we determine now. Japan's instrument of surrender. I promise I'll be brief with this. Um, we hereby undertake for the emperor, the Japanese government, and their successors to carry out the provisions of the Potsdam Declaration in good faith. And there is, um, there is, there's an argument that these are among Taiwan separatists, that these are just communiques and not actual treaties. But the instrument of surrender was included in volume 59 of the United States Statutes at large, published in 1946, and in volume 139 of the U UN Treaty Series issued in 1952. So therefore, the instrument of surrender, which references both the Cairo and Possum declarations, is a, legal, a legally binding document as far as the UN, the US, Japan, and China are concerned. So this is a legal basis. Now, because of the Civil War um, and the fact that the, in Korea was also, you know, there was also two contending governments in Korea, China and Korea were excluded from the Treaty of San Francisco in 1951 because of the Civil War, because, you know, they were in, this, in states of civil war. This, this was by design in, um, in, um, by the U.S. And you might think, oh, 1951, that's after, that's after um, the Chinese Civil War ended in 1949. Well, there was no treaty or anything at the end of 1949. 1949 is just the declaration of the People's Republic of China. There was, back then, it was still not really certain what would happen, especially with the Korean War going on and all that. But anyways, Treaty of San Francisco, Japan renounces all right title and claim from the to Formosa and the Pescadores, and the treaty was signed in September of 1951, effective in April 28, 1952. And since the treaty does not explicitly state anything beyond Japan surrendering Taiwan and Penghu, the separatists claim that the, stat the status of Taiwan is legally undetermined while arguing that the Cairo and Potsdam declarations are not legally binding. But while China was excluded from the Treaty of San Francisco, the U.S. basically made Japan conclude a separate treaty with the, um, the so-called Republic of China government on Taiwan, namely the Treaty of Taipei. And note that it was signed on April 28th, 1952, which is the same date that the Treaty of San Francisco came into effect. So it's kind of like, 
you know, we're going to exclude you from the Treaty of San Francisco, but uh, include this separate treaty with the government that we do recognize because the U.S. recognized um, the so-called Republic of China on mm -hmm. on Taiwan as a legal government of all of China until, I believe, uh, mm -hmm. 1979, January 1st, 1979. So the U.S. has actually, all in the U.N. too, they have always recognized one China. It's just their recognition of, their definition of China has just changed from Taipei to Beijing. So one China is nothing new, ever, especially ever since the Cold War, especially ever since the ever since the mainland and Taiwan were governed separately. The world has still recognized one China, just with differing definitions of one China. Article two of the Treaty of Taipei, basically, you know, just saying that Japan renounces all rights to whatever. And it. Yeah. And um, also Article 10 of the Treaty of Taipei, it stipulates that um um, the former inhabitants of and inhabitants of Taiwan and Penghu and their descendants are Chinese. Well, Republic of China, but still Chinese, in accordance to the laws which you know have been enforced by the Republic of China in Taiwan and Penghu. And um, yeah, so legally, the people who are on Taiwan are no longer Japanese citizens, and. They're, and, oh yeah, there's another point of confusion. There's like um, conspiracy theorists who think that oh, all this stuff is happening because Japanese people stayed behind. No, like nearly all the Japanese people went back to Japan. There's if you have any questions on that, you can ask me later. So whether or not you believe Taiwan is a part of China is one thing, but it goes to show that in regards to this issue, China is abiding by international law, while the U.S. is violating it. When it kind of flirts with Taiwan separatism, it doesn't even it doesn't even like go out and fully support Taiwan separatism. So I mean the and you can see the theory of undetermined status of Taiwan is th is a result of very a very selective interpretation of all these various treaties and now for I'm all the for all the people who who claim that Taiwan is a country is an independent country etc point me to a country that recognizes Taiwan as a country and or or point me to the Taiwan's own declaration of independence show me show me the statement the, the, the taiwan government has never <laughs> declared independence of taiwan right. never so and there is no international law there is no no formal treaty recognize taiwan as its own country so there you go i mean in like fact, this is in fact when constitutional reforms happened in the um in, at the turn of the century to um at the turn of the century in taiwan um there were like these constitutional amendments and the preamble to it says like basically like these are the it was basically done to restore like bourgeois democracy without um with, without waiting for reunification first because the justification in the past for um martial law and the suspension of democracy was okay our country is not reunified and most of the territory is not under our control well if you want to, the people and the, after the liberal opposition to the KMT, the kind of the liberal reforms happened, and they needed to like kind of codify it into law. So then there were these additional amendments that made it like allowed. And the preamble starts with these are these articles are to like meet the requirements of our country prior to reunification. So even the constitution of the so-called Republic of China, which I guess people call the Taiwanese constitution does not recognize Taiwan as a country. In fact, it's a it's a pro-reunification constitution. It's just um the DPP doesn't really it, it's it's strange because the DPP came to power as part of it emerged from the liberal opposition to the KMT. And um Taiwan's separatism has I mean there are some grassroots elements, but the fact that most people to like that a lot of the youth kind of like are indifferent or bought into it is a is a result is a result of a carefully and en socially engineered top down thing. Also, taking advantage of the fact that the KMT did have its successes in the past and did um, mishandle the internal contradictions of Taiwanese society and all of that. So um, yeah, I mean, yeah, but how does but then people are like, well, the Republic of China exists on Taiwan, so there's still like its own separate country. Well, um, both. As we mentioned, both of the constitutions un operate under a one China framework, and um, the PRC views itself as the successor state of the ROC. So, legally, mm -hmm. from the perspective of Beijing, Taiwan and other territories controlled by Taipei constitute 
a renegade region of the Republic, but are nonetheless um, by law a part of the PRC. It's just the 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 reasoning is okay. Well, you know, it's the result of the civil war. It's an internal issue. It's like it's like you have a you have a renegade region, and it's like we can just kind of let it chill there until we feel like we, we feel like resolving it. Now the this, um, yeah, this is why it's a Shanghai communique signed in 1971 between Nixon and Zhou Enlai is so important and, and forms the foundation of the Sino-American relationship ever since because the, the communique recognized Taiwan issue is an issue to be resolved by Chinese people on the both sides of the Taiwan Strait. It, it, it recognizes internal Chinese matter. Now, there are a lot of people today who say, oh, Shanghai communique is not a law. You know, this is not a U.S. law. Sure. It, 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 technically, you are correct. But Shanghai communique, you know, which is signed by the president of the United States, it, this forms a mutual understanding for paving the Sino-American relationship onwards. You know, th this is how U.S. and China finally normalized relationship in 1979. And, 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 and U.S. shifted its recognition from the government on Taipei to the government in Beijing. Is that Taiwan issue is an issue to be settled among Chinese people themselves. And, and, and right now, what U.S. has, has done in, those, in the last several years is in clear violation in spirit of the Shanghai communique. It now, now, uh, you know, on contrast to this long-standing, um, long-standing understanding be between U.S. and China, that 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 built a firm foundation upon the Sino-American relationship was built upon. Now, U.S. is challenging that. U.S. is saying no. Uh, now, Taiwan is a, a opportunity for us to use as a palm, as a chip. To, to, to stop the rise of China, because that's what is, what is really about. You, you, U.S., for all its rhetoric, U.S. is a politician. I would even say most people in U.S. don't give a shit about Taiwan. <laughs> you know, most people in U.S. wouldn't even be able to tell the difference between Taiwan and Thailand. Oh, you're from Thailand? Right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's so true. And I mean, yeah, you mentioned the Shanghai communique and how... There are detractors who say, oh, that's not law. Essentially, all of what the United States does in terms of foreign policy is not law. There's no, there's no, there, 90 plus percent of it is not law. The only thing that becomes law is when, yes, it, when, when there are, for example, what's happening in Ukraine, where the United States uh, uh, throws that into the NDAA and the each mil in the military budget and says, "Oh yeah, now that's law, right? It's a law. We're sending that. It's put down on paper. We voted on it. We're sending the weapons." But most of what the United States does in terms of its foreign policy is not a law. I, I mean, the United States threw out even its own War Powers Act a long time ago uh, when it invaded Iraq in 2003. But I think you raise both raise really important points about how this is an affair that's to be settled, uh, a, a dispute that's to be settled among the people of China, among uh, the uh, governments, the, admin the, the People's Republic of China and the uh, Republic of China, which uh, all the way up until the recently, yes, the Taiwan administration, which, which <laughs> now there is, and I think I want to get into this a little bit deeper so people understand this. And I want, I, 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 you know, either Xiang Yu or Carlos, you can jump in. Can you talk about the U.S. role in fueling this separatism that's happening in Taiwan? Because, I mean, I say this all the time. The United States has a $14 billion. This is as of the Trump administration. A $14 billion backlog of weapons that it's been pumping into Taiwan. It hasn't even gotten to all of them yet. I don't even know what that's going to be like once Biden is 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 through, uh, likely in 2024. But uh, nonetheless, there seems to be a kind of parallel process happening, to use a therapy term, uh, where <laughs> Taiwan's administration, uh, President Tsai Ing-wen and the DPP, seem to be getting more and more, at least rhetorically, bolder in, in, with the separatism. I always think back to this uh, 2021 article in Foreign Affairs, Tsai Ing-wen wrote, where she literally says that Taiwan is democratic and Western. 
right? With a little bit of Chinese civilization sprinkled in there, right? Like, <laughs> I, like, like when I heard that, I'm like, wow. She's fundamentally she's Chinese just, with a little bit of Western influence sprinkled just, here. Yeah, there. I know. Right? Like, like, but she put Western first, Western Democratic. Race. So, you know, obviously there's this ideology that is spreading and it's fueled by propaganda. And the United States is awash in it. And it's in both parties. Uh, continue to talk about Taiwan like a country. Trump uh, uh, passed the Taipei Act with the whole WHO scandal, all of that. There's been so many violations of this already, and Pelosi is fanning the flames. So can you talk about the U.S.'s role in fueling the separatism, which, I mean, it seems to be causing, in the beginning, we talked about the economic issues. Uh, it seems to be causing a lot of uh, uh, at least little-known discord politically, which helps what, Carl, you were talking about, this broader agenda, the U.S. has a broader agenda, which is to use Taiwan as a chip in this new Cold War and this militarism. So could you talk about the U.S. role in, in Taiwan uh, in terms of politically, militarily, etc.? I have one request. Yes. Leave everyone up so it can feel like we're having a conversation and we can all jump in at any time. It's going to get more natural. Because, um, you got no. it. You all got right. it. The guess, the, uh, the, uh, your wish is my command. Thank you. So there's many layers of like contradictions in all of this, and I want to just be go very brief in it and how the U.S. kind of um, took advantage of certain contradictions to ensure its um, ensure its um, interest in the region. The KMT. When people think about the KMT, what do you think of Chiang Kai Shek? He went to Taiwan in 1949. End of story. Oh, he and you might you might say, oh, he carried out a brutal like um, white terror. Like there were like political prisoners and like communists were killed. And separatists don't really say communists were killed. They'll just say uh, people were killed, and they make they kind of imply that those were like Taiwan separatist heroes, but <laughs> they weren't. Well, there's a huge movement, right, in terms of the separatists to like wash away some key parts of, especially the communist party there, and, it's, it's and the revolution. It's interesting because the DPP is. I would say the DPP at this point. And the separatists, they hate Chiang Kai-shek more than Chinese mainlanders do. Chinese mainlanders just say, okay, he's a loser, whatever. But he was a loser, but he's a bastard, but he's a Chinese bastard and a Chinese loser, and he's still family, but he has his own little little doghouse out there, whatever, his own playground. That's like the mainland Chinese mentality. Wouldn't you say that's correct, Carl? Especially nowadays. I know in like 1950, they might still say like, oh, he's a bad guy, whatever. But nowadays, it's like, it's been so long, like they don't care. He's been dead for forever. And um, yeah, so there's that. And um, there is this one, under people need to understand this about the KMT, is that the KMT today is not the KMT of Chiang Kai-shek era, and the KMT of the Zhang Jingguo era was not quite the KMT of the Chiang Kai-shek era. Zhang Jingguo is Chiang Kai-shek's successor and son, by the way, who was Deng Xiaoping's classmate who studied in the Soviet Union for a long time. So he kind of took, his governance kind of took a little bit of um, influence, inspiration from the Soviet Union in many ways. Um, and then the, the KMT of Jiang Jingguo was not the same as the KMT of Li Denghui, who was his liberal successor. Now, Cold War. The, usually, you know, when the U.S. props up a um, puppet regime, it encourages, like, full-on, like, kind of, especially after, like, Pinochet and stuff, like, kind of the shock therapy, full-on austerity, like, free, hardcore free market instead of developmentalism and stuff. Well, um, Taiwan, well, in face of a communist threat, you need to build up a model capitalist societies. And to build up a model capitalist society, it needs to be done in a very economically illiberal way. And um, to, to get that done, you also kind of need an illiberal government. Uh, people would say Chiang Kai-shek's rule on Taiwan was, he was a fascist. I feel like his, by the time he got on Taiwan, it was it was more Bonapartist than fascist. Bonapartist developmentalist. He wasn't at the behest. He wasn't at the behest of the. Um, well, what's the word? I can't. I can't. I can't speak English. Um, he wasn't at the. Um, he, he owed nothing to the um, the landed aristocracy in Taiwan. So he did things like land reform to stabilize the rule. Um, I would say the first the first decade of KMT rule in Taiwan. So 1945, KMT was, Taiwan was returned to um, China in 1945 was, I guess, the stabilization of the KMT rule. Okay. The U.S. needs a strong man to keep the communists at bay. Liberals can't, liberals can't co combat communism. Only, Ill, only illiberals, such as fascists and Bonapartists, like, you know, Park Chung-hee can do it. Because if you, 
if there's a strong enough communist movement and you have a liberal democracy and like people, are, there's a rising sentiment of like socialism and those like sort of left politics, they they tend to win out. So um, yeah, but Bonapartists tend to have too many of their own ideas. Jiang Jingguo, Chiang Kai-shek's son. I mean, you, you know Chiang Kai-shek brought a lot of gold to Taiwan from the mainland, like towards the end of the Civil War. Jiang Jingguo knew, hey, we did the KMT, we need, we're not going back to the mainland, realistically. Um, if we need to secure our government, we really need to win the people in Taiwan over, and we need to shed this image of like, oh, this is a party of like, you know, mainlanders who came to Taiwan in like in the 1940s and 50s to like a government that's for everyone in Taiwan. There's that, the identity part. Um, there's also the economic part. We need to really build up the economy. So you know things like um, TSMC, like, um, like, just a lot of like um, a lot of these big major companies in Taiwan, like, what is it like Formosa Plastics? Is that one of them? You know, it's, I, I they're the names. I, I'm not an encyclopedia. I still have to look things up sometimes. But anyways, that was built under like state, like state planning, not like socialist state planning, but still heavy state planning, which is um, you know. It's good for development. It's objectively good for the people, but it's not good for if you're trying to push austerity. It was not a liberal government. So by the time in the 1980s, the Soviet, the socialist threat was kind of it's kind of waning. You know, you have all these like Eastern European countries and the Soviet Union just like standing on on their last legs. Color revolutions are happening everywhere. What people don't realize is the color revolutionary movement, what they call the third wave of democracy. I think. It was a two-pronged thing, color revolutions in the socialist countries and also color revolutions in these Bonapartist puppet states to remove these strongmen like Jiang Jingguo in favor of more malleable liberals so they can carry out political liberalizations, which will enable economic liberalization, neoliberalism and austerity and all of that. And this is where I think the Taiwan independence, Taiwan separatist ideology comes in. Well, first off, in the 1980s, there was the rising, the rising of Dangwai movement. The Dangwai movement literally means like the out of the party movement, like out, because the KMT was the only legal party. You weren't allowed to form other parties until they democratized, but um, you were allowed to be independent. So Dangwai was like just an informal like coalition of like just everyone who's not in the KMT. They were the liberal opposition to the KMT. And because um, they weren't communists, because all the communists, the communist movement had basically been eradicated by Jiang, like Jiang Jiexi, Jiang Kai-shek. So um, they're liberal. They had these like ideas saying like, hey, um, you know, we want just they don't talk about class like struggle and stuff, but we want votes. We want we want like free elections. We want to directly elect the leader. This government is not representative of the people because um, because of martial law, it was like appointed, and it's all, it also happens to be like mostly made up of like people who arrived to Taiwan from the mainland in like you know 1949. So there is that sort of identity element. This is not to say the, the majority of Taiwan is still Han, by the way, but it's like the different waves of like Han migration and the previous the, the existing population of Taiwan. They tend they came over many generations before it was ceded to. Um, Japan and mo mostly from one area of um, China, the southern Fujian, and you, and now nowadays you have like and then like in 1949 you had like a bunch of mainlanders from like all different parts of China, so like to them it's like oh it's a little bit foreign, you know. So there is that sort of disconnect, and also you were um, separated from from them for like 50 years because of Japanese rule. So there was this sort of mutual distrust, like the new government, like kind of the KMT kind of viewing like all Taiwanese people as like questioning their loyalty to mm -hmm. like. China because they were brainwashed by the Japanese for such a long time. And you also had a class, the landed aristocracy. And you know, like the landed and class society, like these like classes, like it's not the number, it's not necessarily the numbers game. It's like, you know, ownership, property ownership and stuff. Right. Landed aristocracy. They, they were basically collaborators with the Japanese. And after, and even after, after the civil war, when the, when the KMT arrived, they still had that wealth and the connections, but they were ousted politically because the KMT was, you know, mostly like the elites from the mainland. Um, well, most of the population from the mainland were actually like working class, like, you know, soldier veterans and stuff who didn't even want to be in Taiwan in the first place. But there is, this is a recipe for like a lot of contradictions to take advantage of. So yeah, you have existing, existing um, 
dissatisfaction with the KMT and also with US that really wants to liberalize. So what does it do? It kind of supports the liberal, um, the liberal um, opposition to the KMT. That's why like all those like Dangwai magazines, like when they were in exile because Jiang Jingguo was like, was kind of like trying to crack down on it to, you know, maintain stability. Jiang, Jiang, Jing, Jiang Jingguo is a very interesting character because um, he's, yeah, he, he knew he was a US puppet, but he hated the fact. And in his diary, like, especially after the US and the diplomatic ties, he started re referring to America as Meidi, which is like US empire, which probably a term that he used in his Soviet days. So um, yeah, while at the same time, the KMT had different factions. So the US mm -hmm. also supported the liberal faction of the KMT represented by Li Denghui, who was picked because of the whole identity issue. Like Jiang, like they wanted to have like a local Taiwanese be like, enter like the higher echelons of power in Taiwan. 1988, Jiang Jingwu dies. Um, Li Denghui, the, the local Taiwanese, who was also a liberal, succeeds him. And um, he worms his way up into KMT chairmanship. So he secured re-election because um, if he didn't do that, the only guarantee was he would have continued ruling until 1990, and then the KMT would have just like picked a new guy. But he became KMT chairman, so he could, you know, do that. He carried out liberalization, democratized. He became the first directly elected leader in 1996. And um, here's the thing: um, if the people in Taiwan continue to view themselves as Chinese, right, and and they see a mainland China that's rising and that's doing well that's showing good faith to the people in Taiwan and saying, hey, you can come, we can, you know, build a better China together. That threatens, that, that threatens um, Taiwan's status as a U.S. Um, puppet. Now, Li Denghui was a liberal. He's like, and he's also interested in his own power. People say, oh, he was secretly a separatist this whole time and just like hid that from Jiang Jing. I don't believe that. I think um, he was always um, an opportunist. He was always a, um, he was always a liberal. And he spoke of reunification because he genuinely thought that the CPC would fall. Like, er, uh, like it was a popular belief in the late '80s and the early '90s. But when it became evident that that wasn't the case anymore, how do you maintain the status quo of Taiwan as a status as as a client regime and also push economic liberalization, neoliberalism, austerity? You have to kind of create a rift in this sort of identities. That's when you push the um, hey, we're different. Taiwan is already. But then he mm -hmm. also doesn't declare independence. He'll just. He tries to play all sides, like kind of take the middle road. We don't need to declare Taiwan independence. We're already independent. Taiwan is an independent country called the Republic of China. And our relationship with the mainland is um, special state-to-state -state relations. It sets a precedent. And you know who came up with that um, two-state theory? Tsai Ing-wen, who was Li Denghui's protege. Hmm. And um, this kind of... But even in, the even in the 90s and the early 2000s, people viewed Taiwan separatism as like a force of destabilization in Taiwan. So they still had to pay lip service. Like when Chen Shui-bian, the first DPP leader who was elected in 2000 was elected, he was like, as long as the, C the CPC does not show hostile force and maintains a peaceful position, we will not change the name of our government. We will not make amendments to, the, um, to our constitution that move towards independence. We will not get rid of the um the um what is it? Guo Tong Gang Ning. The our policies of reunification. Like he had to pay lip service to all of this. So, but how do these but how come all of a sudden people in Taiwan start viewing themselves as Taiwanese and not Chinese anymore? Well, I mean, these things a lot of times people think discourse just always comes from the grassroots and that um the ruling class, um, the ruling class kind of co-ops it. But there is also a huge element of just it just being top down. For example, Chen Shui-bian's leadership, 2000 2008, he's the first DPP leader. During then, education was heavily reformed. So in history class, you know, the emphasis on like Chinese history was greatly reduced. Like so, the mainland history stuff like didn't start until like like middle school or high school, whereas you start with like Taiwanese history, like local Taiwanese history, and like. Whereas in the past, like Taiwanese history was viewed as a subset of Chinese history. Now it's like Taiwanese history and then like foreign history, including Chinese history. So you do that to the people, they grow up, they're told, they're, they're educated by schools that they're not Chinese in a subtle way. 
it's not to really push people to like formally declare independence because that's not going to happen. It's to create enough of a stable as like enough enough of a identity crisis where people do not want reunification, and then they're also taking advantage of like all the anti-communist tropes that this that the KMT like pushed in the past. Like so, like they kind of continued that. It's a continuity of that. But a departure from like, hey, but we're still Chinese and we are in the past. It was like we are the real representatives of Chinese culture and we're going to build Taiwan to be a, a model province for the rest of China after um, reunification happens. And for an, to an extent, that was kind of true because like Deng Xiaoping, when he carried his reforms and opening up, he did look at Taiwan in some ways for inspiration on like how to like run the economy. Now it's um, it's like, OK. The economy is shit. There's gonna be a there's gonna be a recession coming up, especially with this chip stuff going on. There's no policy successes of the DPP, right? Like, what has Taiwan done since 2016 that people can really be proud of? What has she done? Uh, well, she was able to send someone to the summit for democracy, December of 2021. <laughs> a, no, nobody watched it, but the uh, Biden administration held that, and Taiwan you know participated. The policy now is okay. They know we can't win people over by the economy, so now we're gonna make people. We're we're gonna we're we're gonna just circle jerk everyone and make them feel good about being Taiwanese and like we had to send the message that we are better than or they don't say mainland anymore they say Chinese like Taiwanese people are not Chinese is like the new line. So um, they do that and um, they keep on they keep on like um, that's the strategy visibility in the international stage make people feel good about about that and then like scare mong fear monger people like you know 2019 Hong Kong protests hey um, yeah, if we yeah. unify then that's gonna happen and you know. The, oh yeah, part of this part of the successful ways to vilify the CPC was hey, the KMT Chiang Kai Shek, very bad. He carried out white terror, and he came from the mainland, and his government came from the mainland, uh, and the CPC is also on the mainland. So mainlanders bad and evil. So like it's blue version of and red version of the same thing. That's how right. they do the fear mongering. So it's it's effective. So go so go green then. Go green. No no red no blue. Go green. Yeah, but the green but, but the green is also like in many ways it's a content it's a continuity of like the bad elements of the KMT. Is this is what I say? The TLDR of Taiwan of Taiwan's post nineteen forty nine history govern for like governed first for a few decades by the worst of the mainlanders and then govern. For a few more decades until present times, by the worst of the local Taiwanese, would that be accurate, <laughs> Carl? Carl, do you want to jump it's, in? Anything you want to add before we? This is a this is a wonder of liberal democracy. <laughs> <laughs> in many ways, Taiwan symbolized all the all the kind of ills of liberal democracy that we we know so full well. Um, and and so right, but right now, you know, we we have this. The, the, the big gorilla looming in the background, of course, is United States. You know, for decades, U.S. pretended the government on Taiwan under KMT was the sole legitimate government of all China. You know, that was before 1971. And at that point, U.S. actually had troops stationed in Taiwan. During the Vietnam War era, you know, up to 30,000 U.S. troops were on Taiwan. And U.S. had stationed nukes in Taiwan, yes. pointing at mainland China. They had nuclear tip missiles stationed in Taiwan, pointing to China. Uh, U.S. Air Force, U.S. Army, U.S. Navy, all branch of U.S. military were stationed in Taiwan. The result of Nixon visit in 1971 and the result of the Shanghai communique is that U.S. military withdrew from Taiwan. You know, at least overtly, Taiwan yes. does not look like a occupied <laughs> a military occupied client state anymore you know i had uh i had met a, a a taiwan mechanic who worked on you know who, who is a taiwan air force mechanic who worked on the airfield when the americans uh, used to station he told told them like the the americans wouldn't even let them touch the <laughs> touch the american planes because they feel like <clears throat> All the because you guys are all Chinese, you're all possible spies. <laughs> so they wouldn't even let them into the hangar to touch the the the, the American assets over there. Back this is back in the days, back in the 1970s. Um and 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 so that was again that 1971, that was the basis for this new Sino-American relationship. Because because uh, Nixon has pledged for the US pull back 
from Taiwan to recognize the Taiwan issue is an internal Chinese matter to be resolved by Chinese people on the both sides of the Taiwan Strait. That provided for the kind of the stable Sino-American relationship from 1970s onwards until very recently. I mean, well, what has changed? What has changed is that now the U.S. ruling elite has been scared big, you know, they, they're scared big just Jesus by, by the rise of China. It looks like, you know, China is going to upset the U.S. dominant position as the world number one hegemon. And now it's doing whatever it can to stop the rise of China. And, and Taiwan, U, U.S. politicians recognize perfectly Taiwan is a flashpoint. Taiwan yeah. is, uh, 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 is there's a clear defined red line by by the Chinese government in Beijing about what they will and will not tolerate around the issue of Taiwan. What we're doing right now, what U.S. government doing right now is testing waters. They're doing the so-called salami slicing that they they like to accuse China of doing. They're they're they're, they're testing waters. Uh, first, it was during the Trump administration. It was leaked that U.S. for the first time sent military to Taiwan. A U.S. Marine was posted in Taiwan under the pretense that this American Institute on Taiwan falls into, you know, part of the U.S. diplomatic uh, compound. So they must be secured by Marines. Right. Which is this is which I mean, there's a few Marines there does not make any difference at all. This all this all the purpose of doing this is to provoke China, to provoke a reaction. I mean, so far, China has actually acted pretty reasonably rational in, in handling this. But but the Chinese foreign ministry and the Chinese PLA has stated on, under no unequivocal terms that Pelosi do not come to Taiwan, yeah. right? Because he's she's not going in the capacity as a private citizen. I mean, if after November election, if she's no longer a congressman woman, and then she can visit Taiwan, no, no one give a shit. But right now, she's going in a capacity as a speaker of the house. No, this level of U.S. Congress person, like I said, speaker of house is second in line to succeed the U.S. president. You know, the first in line is the vice president, and the second in line is is uh, is speaker of the house in case right. if something happened to Biden. And, yep. and and this high level senior U.S. politician to visit Taiwan is pretty unprecedented since the signing of Com Shanghai Communique, you know, since 1979. Oh, and 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 this is uh, this is definitely breaking a protocol. And, and U.S. knew exactly what they're doing, because right now they're deploying military assets all around Taiwan. You know, they're, they're ratcheting up the tension. They, they know they're, they're going into stirring up the hornet nest. And, and the, the whole purpose is just to see how China would react. I mean, this is not a very responsible uh, uh, behavior for, for someone who claims to be for the peace and stability of the Pacific. Uh, uh, U.S. is a warmonger here. Let, let's, make, let's, let's make it clear. Yeah, no. And I, Shan Yu, I'm going to kick it to you about this point in a minute. So keep hold your thought because I know you have a thought about something internal to Taiwan, but I think it's important that let's let's mix in, you know, especially for the last maybe half hour or 45 minutes that we have mix in. Uh, I think those thoughts with what you guys are speaking of. right Yeah. Now. Yeah. Because the U.S. Right. Uh, uh, bringing it back to this current moment, we just went over this a large history and showing you and, and Carl. You both did, I think, a great job summarizing what is a very complex situation in in Taiwan within its internal uh, politics within the Taiwan administration. But it, what you were saying, Carl, about this kind of broader issue with the U.S. Uh, kind of at the core of this, uh, this militarism and this, you know, this recklessness, because, I mean, what's so, what, what to me is so interesting about this is that, uh, one, Nancy Pelosi, as you said, is second in command, really third in command if Biden, if you count Biden, if you count Biden, she's third in command but a lot of there's a lot of western media that says oh well in in 1997 newt gingrich you know uh the republicans had control um uh, uh of congress at that time he went and he did the same thing 1997 was a completely different time in u.s china relations completely different and newt gingrich 
was a Republican and one of the most vocal detractors of Bill Clinton, not on the right side of history in that uh, argument, but at the same time, uh, was a very vocal opponent of Bill Clinton. And uh, the one China policy uh, was not nearly as besmirched, was not merely as uh, uh, disrespected then as it has been now. We've witnessed a period, especially since 2012. I hate. I, I don't want to just say it started with Trump, although we know that Trump escalated things. But over the last decade since this pivot to Asia, the incredible invest, uh, redeployment and investment, new investments in military in, in military buildup in the Asia Pacific is just. Uh, I don't think people understand how severe it is, how significant it is, how big it is. We're talking about 50% of all U.S. military assets, 60% of its entire Navy. We're talking about 400 military bases surrounding China in the Asia Pacific. And you have constant uh, buildups along the so-called uh, first island chain of uh, just missile technology and and as you said carl there are sorties being dropped and tested all of the time uh in this in this airspace and i know you carl have talked a lot about this the air defense identification zone that taiwan uh, taiwan's media u.s western media always talk about right china's flying planes here well it includes china's territory like mainland china territory fujian province uh and, and more uh, but also it, it was something that was created by the United States. It's not any kind of it has no legal authority. It was created in the United States pre uh, uh, 1940. And it's it's a it's a World War II relic that was all about Cold War and attempting to reassert dominance in Asia following the uh, the 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 end of Japan's kind of colonial domination in that region. So all this is to say is that. The U.S. I mean, this is a dangerous. Pelosi is is playing with fire. Uh, I I believe. Well, I believe I I believe that what happens here. You know, I, I tend to think. I, I know we talked earlier showing you about how we don't we don't really think that a nuclear war is necessarily going to start over this, but the rudiments are being built up, and we should take seriously China's assertion of its sovereignty that if there is any kind of provocation by the United States that China sees as serious enough, that it will take measures militarily. And it doesn't mean it's going to shoot down Pelosi's plane, but it means that there will be measures taken and that it would see itself as having uh, entirely the right to do so. And so that I, then leads to Carl, what you were saying, the United States is really to blame here. The United States is, it has no right to be here, no right to be there. It is the problem. And the way that this is talked about rarely is that uh, how this issue is posed. Even now, you have Ro Khanna talking about who are the Chinese, who are the Communist Party of China to dictate anything. You know, that's how that's how the Western media talks about this. That's how uh, much of the U.S. Who, political class talks about this. Who, who are the Chinese to dictate what happens around their waters? <laughs> you know, that's outrageous. The South China Sea. What's <laughs> like People, what? <laughs> People can just look at a map and to see how far U.S. have to deploy its military forces to the area around China and Taiwan. I mean, we are literally selling uh, military hardware halfway around the world just to 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 contain China, and and this is this is very dangerous. I mean, you, I, I'll, I'll just make it clear: if Pelosi lands on Taiwan. We don't know the, that yet. I mean, you know, Pelosi has been playing a coy. She she did not officially announce it in his her press release, but now we have multiple indications. CNN even reported that the Taiwan reporter and the Taiwan official said it's confirmed that Pelosi is going to arrive in Taiwan tonight. And 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 this is this is totally unnecessary and and this is right now united states is gonna have let me just make it clear there will be a chinese military response if yep. pelosi does land in taiwan right now it's just a question of what kind of military exactly. response that is that is that's just what we're concerning there there's no question about a military response and i you know we, we can see you know Maybe it, it just amount to the uh, Chinese military escort of Thai, of uh, Pelosi's plane 
over Taiwan airspace. Maybe, maybe, maybe it's just that. Maybe it's even more. But right now, I'm not eager to find out. I mean, like, <laughs> who? Well, U.S. is U.S. built itself as a vibrant democracy. You know, when was the last time we had a public debate, lively public debate, to say, is this even necessary? Is it necessary for Pelosi to go to Taiwan and to partic- potentially spark a World War Three? You know, like, no, we not even given this choice. No, Our that's democracy. Yeah, that our politician go ahead and does it, and and does this this and it, and it was going to be secret. Reach- it was going to be like let's be real. Pelosi was not going to put this on the itinerary from the very beginning. She was just going to show up from the beginning. This it only came out some some while some way it came out, and you know she was caught with you know tail between her legs. But that, that this I mean this is how bad it is too. She was just going to go, and then probably take a photo, you know, and that's how we would have found out. In China, maybe maybe the Chinese government would have told us, state media. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, for United States, this is about you know preserving its he- hegemony, but for for China, this is an issue of sovereignty, and that's not something they will compromise. I mean, they, you know, China China don't care about chips production. You know, they they can they can even you know in five years time they will build their own chips. But right now, what what they care is U.S. is seriously challenged challenging the chinese sovereignty right now has, 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 has like never before and this is uh this is serious stuff guys i mean but but yeah i with you know obviously this was taken with very careful and deliberate public discussion in us <laughs> on why we could potentially go into a, a nuclear exchange you know thanks guys <laughs> uh, uh um Xiang Yu, do you want to jump in? I, the yeah. Only th- yeah, jump in, jump right in. <laughs> so um, really quick question I saw in the comments. Someone said, oh, it's because um, a lot of DPP people might have like Japanese ancestry. This is not true. Um, I, I said earlier, um, the, 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 the class makeup of like the local Taiwanese, like Ben Shepard and then like the, the arrivals, whatever. There, there were a lot of, um, a lot of Japanese collaborators among like the, um, the, the landed aristocracy. And a lot of the elites in the DPP come from those types of families. That's that's what it is. Um, there there are class allegiances like in the past. They 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 do have that sort of leaning, but it's not because of blood. Um, don't tell this to the North Koreans. But Kim Jong Un is a fourth Korean heritage. Is is he like there? Um, like kissing Japanese ass. <laughs> yeah. So um, yeah. Just, but, um. Anyways, um, back to the um, back to the meat and gravy of all this. Um, I think given the direness of the situation, why? Why um is the DPP acting so recklessly and why aren't the people in Taiwan um, restraining it? These are questions that we need to ask. And um, I, people, people um, say Taiwan is a very vibrant democracy, but all of that is eroding away. Taiwan is turning into a democracy that's like Japan, where it's like it's nominally a democracy, but it's it's really been LDP this whole time, the Liberal Democratic Party. And the, and the DPP is basically turning into like the Taiwanese version of the LDP. Mm. And my biggest fear is if this stuff goes on, we could end up in a situation where um, Chiang Kai-shek's white terror doesn't look that bad. <laughs> there, right. that's, it's very possible because I did speak of um, uh, uh, um, uh, the – impending recession with um, mainland China and the U.S. surpassing TSMC and chip chip um, fabbing capabilities. So it loses its economic leverage. 2024 comes or 2025. We, Taiwan can do referendums every, every odd year. So 2025, like the new leader gets elected. And I feel that the next leader will be the current vice leader, um, uh, Lai Qingde, or his, or his, um, like his, his name, his Western name, William Lai. Yeah, he, yeah, it's, um, and he's considered to be a little bit more, a little bit more, more hardline on like the separatist issue. Because I told you earlier, at this point, the DPP, all the DPP has to like win the Taiwanese youth over is circle jerking about like the Taiwanese identity. That's all he has left in 2025 comes. Could there be a referendum for independence? And if there is, the mainland is definitely going to react. Yeah. But, if people really think about the situation, you look at like these uh, military um, propaganda videos in Taiwan, they're starting to hide like tanks and like like anti-aircraft missiles and stuff in the cities, like in like a, in like 
apartments and, and um, garages to apartment complexes and stuff like that. What does that mean? It means that it's prepared that in a state of war, the civilians, the civilians are going to be um, human shield, human yeah. shields. Yes. As a taxpayer, how could they not want, be? How could they not? As be? a taxpayer, I want the military to be protecting me, not the other <laughs> way around. And um, it's why are people acting this recklessly? It's because they're um, they're being fed a bunch of lies. And like I said, discourse nowadays top down. You see, like YouTubers, a lot of them they're not that grassroots. Like the Tsai Ing-wen administration at this point, I mean, you, you have like the TV stage ch- state channels like um like a uh, Min Shi, like FTV. Um, it's basically run by the DPP, and then you have a bunch of like partnerships between like Tsai Ing-wen and a bunch of uh, YouTubers. So they've created this huge echo chamber, and people are they, they just keep telling people, yeah, uh, they don't say mainland China, they say China. But China is a paper tiger. It's it's not going to attack us. We can just keep on stepping up to the red line and just keep on stabbing it in the yeah. eye, and nothing's ever going to happen. And people people believe that. But here's the thing, right now. Under international law, the U.S. U.S. aircraft carriers can get within a, a thousand nautical miles of China before the PLA has the right to blow them up. Current missiles can fly eight hundred miles, so the U.S. isn't protecting shit. So why has why hasn't the CPC decided to reunify by force yet? Is it because it's incapable? Is it because it's it's wary of a U.S. retaliation? Nothing at the at this point. The only U.S. retaliation it can do is nukes, and nukes yeah. mean mutually mutually assured destruction. So, um, so I mean, what really needs to be done is, if I ask you, I, as um to my to my um to our international viewers, well, Western viewers mostly, if you really care about the twenty three twenty four million people on Taiwan think about these consequences because it's this is not a simple matter of oh china just being the aggressor you know there's even if you believe taiwan should be an independent country independence means independence it doesn't mean being the u.s's stooge and having all these policies being being like having a gun held to your head basically and saying you have to do this do this do this so if this is not real independence it's not Especially you've seen like after like the liberalization of Taiwan and like the economic liberalization, you have like, you know, like city owned and like province owned, whatever, like uh, so-called state owned, like credit unions, like being privatized into banks, like um, Fubang Bank. And like we're in a small, like small businesses and families no longer have access to affordable loans and they're pushing this sort of austerity. And on top of this, there's this recession. You know what this is? If things get very dire and people don't wake up to these facts and they're really frustrated with their um with their with their lives they will they will turn to ideologies like fascism you don't people this, aren't born fascists you don't anti-fascism isn't just like oh you 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 go and you cry about people saying like mean things no there is a very material reason why like large swaths of the population become fascist and if you're not doing the work to prevent that you are no matter how what kind of things you say you're going to enable that so we need to first first and foremost i think among, this is a problem with um people in the west who call themselves communists or pro china is there's this tendency to um dehumanize even the the, the living the, the the average civilians in taiwan because you know oh, they want to be they want to be like edgy like ah oh, fuck taiwan yeah china one china yeah which true but it's it's um if you carry that, if you carry, if, if you've dehumanized the people like that and, and, and you just don't give a fuck about like their, um, their, their well being, then your the logical conclusion will be, hey, let them push themselves to the brink of war and like get end up in a military situation where the civilians are human shields. And then it's going to be another situation where, okay, the PLA can win, it can do it easily. The, you, the RAND Corporation, US military experts admit that. Yeah. But how is it going to deal with the aftermath? Whereas, Need to just we need to cast aside illusions in the words of um of Mao Zedong. We need to um we need to um really drive the message home saying, hey, the same people uh, tell, tell tell like popular opinion needs to needs to pressure both the the puppet regime in Taipei and then also the US government saying, Hey, we don't want our taxpayer money to be going to this. People in Taiwan need to say we don't want we don't want 
you to be we don't want to you to be funding like democrats re-elections so you can like promote this like visibility of taiwan and circle jerk about like um how ta- be, be feeling good about being taiwanese when our the 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 um economic basis of why like at one once upon a time being taiwanese was a source of pride in the chinese community it's it didn't come from anywhere it came from a certain um developmental like trajectory that's going away when when you're when you're claim to this sort of pseudo soft power when the foundation erodes away it's going to be a disaster right i mean and you know what way Oh. I'm sorry. It's, it's just, you know, way Taiwan is very similar to U.S. I mean, a lot of ills that plague the Taiwanese society today plagues a lot of the so-called advanced economies and liberal yeah. democracy in the West. And and it's right now the there's not too much economic future for the youth. And so the politicians, rather than focusing on fixing the economy, they they focus on. Uh, divisive issues, you know, they, they focus on identity issues and they focus on, um, you know, stirring up tr- trouble abroad, like foreign policy that nobody really understands at home. But you know, they they can they can do what you know. Like, let, let's it's all China's fault. You know, let's let's just blame China. That's a that's the safest, yep. easiest way. Just shift blame to this big bad China, and yeah. that is the source of all your problems. It's not because we're not doing anything to build this country. It's not because we're not investing in the infrastructure or, uh, and. And so, so this is the situation we're in right now. There's no reason why we should even be in a, a, a military competition with China. This, nobody has ever asked that question, right? And and the thing about Taiwan is ultimately it, the Taiwan issue is a Sino-American issue because, like yeah. you said, right now the, the the government on Taiwan are beholden. To their to their puppet masters in Washington, you know, even Tsai Ing Wen, she would not go make make an outrageous uh, a claim without explicit backing, you know, from from the U.S. officials. And and, and right now, U.S. official is very much interested to kind of uh, kind of stoke up the fire to to. To, to encourage these Taiwanese politicians to push for a more confrontational line. And that's what we're seeing right now. Yeah, let me just jump in, Chang, you, uh, if you have uh, further comments. I just want to, you know, say that, I mean, everything uh, that you guys are saying is so true. And, and I think that you hear in the Western media a lot about Ukraine, right? And you hear this comparison between Ukraine and Taiwan all of the time. I mean, you've you've had you had um, the uh, so-called U.S. ambassador that that Taiwan uh, nominee. I, for, I forget her name, but she penned an op-ed. I remember when uh, Russia uh, uh, did its uh, initiated its special military operation, saying, "Oh well, this teaches us." that uh you know that we need to be vigilant against authoritarianism and we have to be careful about china right china could do the same thing to taiwan right and there's been this comparison over and over again of, without any of course we already we went over the diff uh, of course the obvious differences one china principle there's none of that exists with ukraine ukraine is considered it's it's at the united nations seated at the united nations it's considered a sovereign country however <laughs> hey, let's not even get into the history of that but the one thing that's very similar here, though, is similar to what you were saying, Carl, about Taiwan and the United States and like kind of like the capitalist, lib- so-called liberal capitalist world being afflicted by these problems. Ukraine is kind of is, is the, the model that the United States has with Ukraine. I think one of the reasons they make this comparison all the time is they want that model with Taiwan. They want Taiwan to be the same kind of chip. And that's what they've been doing. And a lot of people don't get that comparison. They'll think they think. They, they are so propagandized to believe it's all China, China, China's aggressive, aggressive. It's like Russia and Russia, Russia is aggressive. But the fact of the matter is, is that the United States, just as it was using Ukraine as a chip with NATO membership and militarization and all of that, doing the same to Taiwan, regardless of the differences. The U.S. doesn't care about these differences. It really doesn't care. What it cares about is how it is going to get to China. And my theory, this is just a theory. I don't have basis in fact. I just have Pelosi's history is that she is trying to leverage this for the midterm elections. She's trying to take a tough on China stance without saying so. 
And she has a history of this uh, in 1990. I believe it was 1991, was yes. it? Uh, where she went to China and pulled a whole stunt, brought the corporate media with her, CNN. There, there was the former Beijing bureau chief of CNN who actually wrote an op-ed in Foreign Policy magazine lambasting Pelosi saying this is dangerous because of what you did to me <laughs> because you made me put the can you made me put the camera on you. I mean he's playing victim here I don't think he was very you made me put the camera on you while you did this and then the Chinese police got angry at me um but nonetheless she's done this before she has a thing about China she met with the Hong Kong protesters of course a lot of those folks uh, ended up going to Taiwan right like, like there's a connection there but the uh, uh, she met with the most rabidly anti-China, uh, pro-opposition, pro-separatism, U.S.-backed and funded forces that ended up lobbying for legislation, sanctions uh, against China. Uh, uh, she she has this she has this about her. So there's something personal and political about this as well. And I just wanted to throw that in. Uh, but Xiang Yu, uh, Carl Xiang Yu, whoever wants to jump. Uh, in. Yeah, I mean, definitely. I mean, ultimately. Uh, Nancy Pelosi doesn't really care for United States he, people of the United States either, you know. She just cares for her own career advancement and the stock portfolio of her and her husband. And she she is doing because for her it's a cost-free way of doing yes. grandstanding, you know. Oh, I'm on this Asia trip tour. I stand stood up to the tyrants of China. Look at me. And yes. and this this is a very cheap, easy way. For her to appeal to a certain voter base and and that's <clears throat> that's what politicians do in a liberal democracy and but damn the consequences you know nancy pelosi doesn't have to personally bear the consequences of act of a of a of a shooting war between United States and, and, and China. She's 82. She's never going to get drafted, <laughs> and, you know? And so, so this is what, 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 what we face today. The, the, the problem is in U S you know, despite it being called a democracy, average people like us, we don't really have a voice except on the internet, on the YouTube to, to, to really calling out these kind of crazy stunts by, by our, our politicians. And, um, you know, the, uh, uh, Xiang, you, you, you want to jump in so I don't go on ranting too much. <laughs> um, that was a pretty good rant. I was, you, you should continue. So I figure a better place to jump in. I was too caught up in the rant. <laughs> I mean, I, after a while, I, I sound the same, you know, these, these damn useless politicians getting us in trouble again and again. Oh, seriously. I mean, this, this is not necessary. This is, if it wasn't for the truth. Nancy Pelosi visit the the, the cross strait relationship can continue. There's trade right now. There's a you know forty percent of Taiwan's exports goes to mainland China. Is it forty or sixty percent? Somebody can check 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 cross check my data. But it's it, it has it doesn't have to. This tension does not have to happen. You know people might say, oh you know China China doesn't have to. China should chill out. Shouldn't. Get, get, no, no, this is a sovereignty issue you don't understand. <laughs> China has a particular experience with foreign power imposing their will yeah. on China, on Chinese sovereignty and Chinese territory. This is So this is not something they're willing to concede, right? And they already have a very clearly defined red line. They, they publish it out again and again, say Taiwan is a red line. Do not overstep it. Right now, you po people like Pel uh, Pelosi felt... Oh, you know, by doing by overstepping, this is a cheap way for me to gain some political capital, and 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 so so you know, damn the consequences. That's that's with really the GOP why. too. I mean, this is look, look the Democrats are going to go wherever Pelosi goes. We saw Rokana play lapdog to Pelosi say on CNN and just be like, oh. How uh, I respect Pelosi. How, how dare the how dare China, uh, you know, have any kind of say about what Pelosi does. So we already know the Democrats. They're just going to do whatever Pelosi does. They, they don't. There's no opposition. Even when Biden finds the strength, you know, after getting covid twice and barely being able to talk anyway, but he's like, oh, maybe she shouldn't go. But I haven't talked to her. Why would I talk to her? I don't know. I, that Congress is like a it's like a separate branch. You know, all that all that garbage. But the Democrats are just going to go where she where she goes because she's as she is, you know, if not one of the most top three, she is maybe the most powerful Democrat in Washington. In, but the GOP, 
to me, and this is what the Democrats have been doing for so long, building this big tent. They want more influence among the GOP base. It's a complete miscalculation politically, but they think that if people like Kevin McCarthy, Mike Pompeo, if people like that swoon over what Pelosi does, then somehow it'll help them electorally. It's a huge miscalculation. It's not really <laughs> going to uh, give boost uh, Pelosi's stock or, uh, well, it might boost her stocks, but it won't boost uh, the Democratic Party's stock in 2024 because no matter how anti-China public opinion gets in the United States, a lot of that is just based on rhetoric and just constant media, intense pressure and propaganda. It doesn't really influence the polls. People don't go and vote for how much they dislike China. They most of the times they're not thinking about it until they're asked about it directly, like these like very in very misleading, very uh, uh, directed polls. So people aren't going to vote for that. But nonetheless, they do it anyway because on it's all about the donors, and that's what we're getting. That's what we're really getting into here is we're getting into donors, we're getting into the military industrial complex, we're getting to finance big finance. They have a lot of they have a lot invested in this big military buildup, this new Cold War. A lot invested, a lot invested in it. But Xiang Yu, uh, uh, if do you want to jump in? I think um, at this point, I mean, we could have our views on whether or not Taiwan is a part of China. But I think one <laughs> one one one. Um, I mean, I I'm, I'm pro reunification, but I think um, even at this point, I'm, I'm like even reaching out to like my pro separatist friends and saying, hey, these are the issues at hand. Would you like this? These are this is what's happening in geopolitics. This is what's happening economically. We need to take this, especially the people in Taiwan. We need to take this very seriously, especially with um nowadays. You know, the, they have that. I talked about the echo chamber set up by Tsai Ing-wen, like the the FTV, the, the YouTubers, and all that. And um, opposition voices that get too big right now in Taiwan, just like get vilified like for example like like um Han Guoyu the the former um leader candidate candidate for leader in 20 2020 he um he had quite a quite a bit of a movement he, he tried to um emulate the sort of um populist but the sort of the populism of Trump but it wasn't like a socialist populism like there's the various trends of populism but it wasn't like a socialist populism but it was a form of hey we want better relations with the mainland. So there is that sentiment among the people, but it's drowned out in the echo chamber. We need to um, spell these things out and kind of get these voices out there. They're not, not necessarily pro-reunification voices, but they are anti-war voices. And we need to connect the dots between who is behind all the saber rattling and pushing us into these sorts of situations. You have people like Vosh, who will just put up the um the the ROC flag like in the thing saying hey, yeah <laughs> we support we support Taiwan yeah fuck yeah no Vosh you are in your you are just gonna play video games and make money off of um something that and, and never face the consequences for the things that you push okay Taiwan is where I consider home it is the the the, the twenty three million twenty three or twenty four million people there are my compatriots they are also the compatriots every single all of those like mainland Chinese people you hate, they might be annoyed at like the shit that like some Taiwanese people say online or the shit post or like all that shit. But at the end of the day, they're still family. Hmm. When you push these politics that that end up hurting the people in Taiwan, it's um it doesn't benefit anybody. It ben oh it benefits like you know it doesn't benefit the people. It benefits certain. And not even the entire elite. There's plenty of elites in the U.S. like um, capitalists who would love to have stable relations with China to like promote trade. Like for example, Elon Musk and his Tesla. Elon Musk. Like, yeah. <laughs> yes. So it doesn't even benefit the entirety of the ruling class. It's just like no. the uh, 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 one section of it. And are we no. going to, are, are we going to kneel down, bow down to them, or are we going to do our best to spread this message that we're spreading? You know what? At this point. You know what? You can be pro separatist. Your opinion doesn't matter. You're not. Gonna, you're not going to change politics in this regard. But, um, yeah, you're. Yeah, I mean, di disregard ideology. Let's look at realistic consequences yes. of Pelosi's visit. Does it benefit 
the interest of majority of Americans? No. no. <laughs> Does it benefit the majority, majority of, of, of Taiwanese people? Does it improve the welfare of Taiwanese people in any way? No. No. <laughs> I mean, so why? Why is she visiting? Why? Why? Why do this crazy stuff that could put, bring potential devastation on a scale we have never seen before? It's like. Somebody stop her right now. I mean, she's right now. So she she's in Singapore and she's going to visit Malaysia. And then she's going to, on her itinerary, she's going to visit South Korea and Japan. So so Taiwan is on her way to fly over. Now, yeah. the question is, you know, I mean, I think that's one of the reasons she did not officially announce it. The question is, will she land? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, then, and then, you know, like, like I said, there's no... Uh, and there's going to be guarantee a Chinese military response if she if she yeah. does land, and and this is this is totally not necessary. I mean, like this is if if you, without this uh, this trip, life can just go on as before. But this is very dangerous. I mean, people, I I, I don't I, I just, people. Uh, people probably don't realize how dangerous it is because they have these this uh, wool pull over their eyes by our corporate media you know that I mean, a lot of people in taiwan because they think they got it covered by the u.s umbrella you know that the u.s u.s hegemony will protect them right but but what they don't realize the u.s sees taiwan no different than they see ukraine it's just it's just a palm you know u.s is willing to fight fight to the last Ukrainians against the Russians. Similarly, they're perfectly fine to fight China to the last Taiwanese on the island, right? And, and that ultimately does not benefit people of Taiwan. Yeah. It, it does not benefit people in the United States either, by the way. And, are the, and, are and the this is what the situation military, we're in right now. And another question we should ask is, is the top brass in the military in Taiwan even willing to do this? Because they're ideologically, most of them are still like pretty like, identify as Chinese because just they were appointed like back when like Hao Boutun was like chief of general staff. So I have my questions about that too. The, 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 mil the higher, the higher echelons of the military is still like the one area where the DPP doesn't have too much of a stronghold. Ooh. Yeah. And I wanted to, that's the thing I've been thinking about. I mean, <laughs> Taiwan has a particular population, its size. It also has only a small section of that in the actual the, armed forces. That, <laughs> like that, that's why in the last few years you see a lot of US think tank pieces crying about how Taiwan is not ready to defend itself, how Taiwan <laughs> military is not ready to fight the Chinese the way that Americans prefer they would do, you know? And and it's like why? Why would they do that? Why would they fight for you? Why would you, they fight for Iran? You know? <laughs> Why would they fight for the Heritage Foundation? It's like they, they, they have their own life to live, man. And like all these and, and all these hawks, most of them are very far from the front line and they will never get deployed to the front line. And 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 they're the ones who are egging us on into this in this kind of crazy, crazy struggle. And this is I, I, I mean, I, I I shit post a lot on the on the on the on, on live on, on my Twitter account, and people are like, "Oh, I, I'm very upset at how you how cavalier you are about this potential nuclear holocaust." You know what? My goal is scare the big Jesus Jesus out of you. You know, people should be scared. People yeah. should be scared. And question: What the hell were we doing this? Why do we allow our it's politicians true. to do this? We shouldn't. You know, you should get off your ass and demand your politician to stop and decease. Uh, or not decease, uh, desist. But uh, yeah, politics. Decease I mean, in a video game. Cease and desist. You know, to cease with Pelosi, I, I mean, I wouldn't I wouldn't complain. I don't know if anyone else would complain. Video game. You know, I wanted to just say, though, with all of these just like thought, you know, I've had a lot of thoughts come in my head when I think about the possible consequences of this. You know, I, I, to me, I have confidence that what Chinese China's response will be strong, but I do think it'll be measured. I do think it'll be whatever is the strongest possible measure to prevent further escalation, but with the caveat that they're not afraid of the U.S. side responding because the U.S. It, you can't control how they respond. You can't control the United States is a, a belligerent empire. It will do what it wants when it wants when it feels like the calculation is correct. So really, that falls on their side. But 
I'm just thinking about not only what you guys were saying with uh, Taiwan's own military within the Taiwan administration, its own military situation being pretty um, fragile, to say the least, in any kind of impending war with China. But even just the entire kind of project, the entire pivot to Asia project, the military buildup, what happens? What what does what happens when the U.S. military with in the U.S. Navy in the Air Force they're confronted with this actual like the Russia special military operation was easy to avoid a direct confrontation with U.S. troops and military personnel because. First of all, it's a border war and NATO is serving as a proxy and, and they focused on the weapons and the sanctions, the weapons and the sanctions, logistical support. Yeah. Training support there. Yeah. But there isn't U.S. troops going to fight in the Donbass region, for example. That, that's not happening. So, I mean, there are plenty of proxies, plenty of neo, neo you know, fascists, neo-Nazis, all of that. But U.S. troops are not doing that. You cannot avoid that in any kind of conflict that starts off in uh, the, the the Taiwan Straits, in the South China Sea, in the larger Asia. You can't avoid it. You can't avoid U.S. personnel being involved. What do they do? do, 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 uh, do is this something? Uh, they they must know what the RAND Corporation thinks. <laughs> they Or at least there must, especially at, at, at a certain level, they must know. Maybe not, you know, I, I would Joe, argue. Whoever. I would argue that U.S. could avoid it. Just sit it out. <laughs> we don't have to do anything. You know, yeah. people always say, "Oh, we got to do something." We got to yep. no. We don't have to do anything. <laughs> you know, why do we have to do something? <laughs> I mean, like this, we shouldn't be even be involved this far from U.S. waters. And and the, right now, it's a, but it's true. Right now, people, certain people on Taiwan, the separatists. They're, they're expecting U.S. to fight for them. <laughs> and, the, and the U.S. side are more thinking in, in, in terms of Ukraine. They want the, tai, tai, the more Taiwanese to die to make China look bad and, and to, to, you know, to, to bolster U.S.'s own uh, you know, crusade against China. This is right. People are not thinking through why we even have to do this. We Start don't. thinking. Start thinking and stop listening to U.S. think tank like policy think tank yep. court eunuchs. Yeah, turn off the the corporate media that pump that promotes them. Pump. I mean, all of these think tank think tankistan whatever you want to call them. They're all the senior fellows. They're everywhere. They're all over the corporate media. They they are the ones okay. screwing all uh, this nonsense. The funny thing is, like uh, Bonnie Glazer, who is one of the biggest China watcher, and yeah. and he's she's a director of the German Marshall Fund uh, Asia program, and she's like the most pro DPP uh, Taiwan separatist uh, think tanker. She just put out a tweet, and she just says, "I'm increasingly think this is not going to be a one day crisis. Buckle your seats, seat belt tightly." Even she is saying this is bad. This is yes. this this well, is this is going to be really bad. I mean, like like when people actually know what they're talking about. Uh, go ahead, go ahead, uh, Xiang Yu. It's bad, not because there's going to be like a nuclear war, like in one day, two day. It's bad because think of the long term trajectory and all of this that's going on and increasing tensions with the mainland and like the economic recession that I talked about with the whole chip scenario and impending, you know. With nothing, with the DPP having no cards left, it can't. It can. It can uh, invite Nancy Pelosi once to like you know get people. Oh yeah, we're our government, our, our administration is doing like so well to like increase our visibility and like Uncle Sam loves us. Yeah, how many Nancy Pelosi's can you invite, and what cards are there going to be after this? And then when there aren't any, I mean, look, pe people like um like CTI, the um one of the um it's a more pro China um media outlet got shut down, got its um broadcasting license revoked by the Thai administration. They're gonna start silencing these sorts of these sorts of voices, and then like as things get worse, people get more desperate, and they have false consciousness, and they're led astray. That's how that's that tends to be how you get fascism and like very bad, um, like you know, author authoritarian like oppression, and it's not gonna come from the blue side this time. And with the sort of technology we have now, it's gonna make Chiang Kai Shek look, um, you know, kind of all right in comparison. I I, I hate I hate. Thought. I hate to make Taiwan and Ukraine comparisons, but yeah, me too. <laughs> you, you, you in Ukraine case, you know, uh, you know, despite all the poverty and despite all the devastation bring by the war, 
at least they they can aspire to EU membership, maybe, yeah. maybe, or, or or NATO inclusion, whatever. There's something they can look forward to. Can try, you know, yeah. <laughs> the, the, the Taiwan independence. What what do you gain from that? What what I mean, like at least. I mean, at least the Ukrainian can, if they have EU membership, they can all migrate to, you know, Britain to work in the service jobs, you know, and especially when they're cut off and completely isolated in the West, right? All those, especially the more bourgeois types, they can, they can migrate and leave and say, screw this wasteland. Taiwan is already a prosperous society. <laughs> I mean, like, like, where do you go from there? You know, you, you, it's not like Ukraine. They at least they're going through this because oh we have to do this to get the eu membership we have to do this so i can we can freely travel to eu taiwan you got you you already have everything like where does the, this independent path even lead, lead uh you know what does it gain you yeah no, i'm not so seems like it gain the, the i mean the pla it's pretty clear that the taiwan independence path gets you war it gets you you know, uh, a force, you know, uh, reunification uh, by force rather than through peaceful means. I mean, that's that's kind of where this this is going to head if things continue on the way they do. And uh, Nancy Pelosi continues to play uh, with fire. And, and, you know, it's not just Nancy Pelosi, though. She is acting on behest, as you both have also reiterated. There's no way she can't be acting on behest of a significant uh, force within the ruling elite. She she is operating on that basis. While she is, I could see her having the hubris. I mean, someone with a twenty-four thousand dollar refrigerator with twelve dollar uh, a pint ice cream in it uh, certainly has a bunch of hubris to them, right? You, you know, you know. I'm sure she's packing those up in her bunker, but uh, for the bunker when the war starts. But she doesn't act on her own. She acts on behest of who uh, who her donors are. And who she has served so diligently, especially over the past several decades. She has served finance capital better than probably any other politician. And that means, regardless of her rhetoric in the past, regardless of whatever she's done in the past, she is beholden to the military state as well. That's why, since Obama, she hasn't really met a war that she does not like. Every single U.S. military provocation intervention by proxy, sanctions, or uh, through occupation, like in Syria, she's been all for. She hasn't. She hasn't batted an eye of opposition. And AOC that, has been has stood by Nancy Pelosi's foreign policy. That's Mama that's Bear. That's Mama that's Bear. Bear. <laughs> and you that's, see a parallel in Taiwan. That's why don't get don't get so tricked by. Okay, imperialism is the highest stage of capitalism. So anti-imperialism is the most fundamental form of class struggle. If you are not, if you if you're not first and foremost anti-imperialist, you're um, you're like pseudo socialist policies in America. They, uh, they hate to say this, but in the grand scheme of things, they don't matter because American lives should not take precedence over lives in the rest of the world. Yeah, yeah. They 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 don't even benefit American lives. It's American. They don't exactly. <laughs> so hire hire um some hire people to like um hire some experts from China who are like good at building high speed rail. Get these job many many jobless people in America go build up infrastructure like lay fiber up. There's so many like middle of nowhere like what in so called like flyover states that don't even have to use like satellite internet because there's no fiber fiber optics. Get them to do that and get people like Vosh to get a real job and lay fiber optics or something. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, no. He. <laughs> that, that's the last thing we're going to see. Keep if dreaming. Vosh, Keep if Vosh dreaming. knows railroad tracks, I would not ride a train that like goes on. Them, I feel like it would be real. Yeah, no. I, I guess in that sense, we're lucky that austerity prevents any of those kind of jobs because uh, uh, we would all we would all be uh, on the side of the road. Yeah, on the side of the tracks. Um, flat. <laughs> um but yeah no i mean i it's it, i i know we're kind of probably rat winding up but but we can keep going like this for a few more yeah. minutes uh, I, this has been great yeah i mean i think it's just a feature of the u.s system if you want to play in the U u.s political arena join the u.s political establishment you almost have to sign on to the u.s imperial agenda because that's fundamentally 
that's yeah. what U.S. is. <laughs> it's yeah. it's an imperialist enterprise, and and if you want to, you know, no matter you know your claims to be progressive, you know, the AOC squad, whatever, you all have to sign up to the U.S. imperialist agenda, and they have, and they, yeah. because they know that's how they stay in the game, and 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 there are people who think, oh. Like that's how we're gonna change them from within, you know. This we're just paying lip service, but that's how we're gonna change the system from the from uh, from inside. But guess what? What end up is system swallows you. <laughs> yeah, once you get than... inside, you're 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 done. <laughs> you're in. You're, yeah. you're in <laughs> it. <laughs> now that the KMT is like a former is a shell of its former self without a clear image. What if like I just go and join the KMT, become like say the message I'm saying now, like kind of take it over and then become Taipei city mayor and then, and then, um, and then suicide myself. <laughs> Xiang Yu, Get you gotta oh, be the, be the liberator, be the liberator <laughs> of the <laughs> island. It, it's, it might be needed now more than ever, but yeah, I want, I want to just say though, that there's first, first off, I mean, we haven't talked to, uh, I know where it's getting late and we're, we're going a while. I probably should go to bed soon, but I feel like this is such a necessary conversation. So let's, let's keep going for a little bit. There's this, we've talked a little bit about the crisis that the United States is in, but the crisis is really, I, I, I mean, when I learned my lesson with the Russia special military operation, I, I did believe that uh, uh, Russia would not have felt so provoked that it, it would have kept um, its, uh, now I didn't believe that that would last forever, but in that situation, I was like, okay, uh, Russia can be the, you know, it, it can take other measures. Nothing's going to happen. U.S. tells like, and of course, Russia obviously felt differently, and, and we didn't know what was going on in the background. For it you're not the only way. one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, that's how we all felt. The same mistake, yeah. But after I mean, it happened, I was like. All right. Obviously, the crisis, the many crises the United States is facing are so severe that what they're doing abroad, what the United States is doing abroad is now facilitating what we had hoped would be unthinkable. You, you said, Carl, you know, you are we there is fear right now. There should be fear right now because how the United States has conducted itself, especially in the last decade, especially you could argue since Obama's. Uh, mid first term till now, right? Especially since 2011, how it has behaved post invasion of Iraq, Afghanistan, post this kind of like full spectrum, uh, you know, during this full spectrum dominance period has been so motivated by these crises that it was, it was almost like a, a powder keg, right? Like, like it was building the, it was, it was fomenting the powder keg that would eventually, that will eventually explode. And so you have a political crisis that's never that hasn't really ended since 2007 2008. There's been uh, just a legitimacy crisis, not even the most popular, you know, Barack Obama, right? By the time Barack Obama was through, he was reeling in terms of so-called popularity. He had loyalists, I mean, a lot of loyalists, but they represented a, a, a tiny fraction. That's why you had Sanders, that's why you had Trump. Then you had Trump. Trump was reeling by the end of his first term uh, in terms of just how people viewed him. And now you have Joe Biden, which is like kind of out of the almost like an out of this world experience of what it means to be both unpopular and incompetent. Right. And also just for, you know, do continuity with the establishment and what it's been doing uh, both at home and abroad. So you have the political crisis then you have the military situation where there is no war with victory anymore. The United States, that that kind of ended 70 plus years ago after World War II. But it's even worse now because after imperialism divided the world, it was all about how do you govern the world? And the United States can't really govern anything. The United States isn't a force for stability anywhere. Everywhere the United States touches, it turns to absolute shit. Like it turns to shit. Destabilization, chaos, all of that ruination sanctions it's just it's just a disaster and it's only making money and then the economic crisis over and over and over again we've had i mean now we're looking at if the recession actually does technically occur they're all fighting about it in the ruling class if it if, if it's not already here that will be what what is that three in the last 15 years i mean we're talking about like an unpre that's an un that's that's the, that's much more than Marx had predicted, guys. <laughs> with capitalism, like this is getting more and more unstable. So the crises 
are just so hot. In the United States, there are elements in the U.S. establishment that are obviously willing to take this to the most extreme in response to them. That's what it seems to me when it when it comes to how I feel about these developments as they occur. The U.S. can no longer govern the world through um, just military might. I mean, Afghanistan proved that wrong. I mean, so did Vietnam and Korea. Oh, Korea to an extent. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it seems that at this point they they don't they're not even trying to. I know, I know, I know. I'm know they're, they're, they're not trying to govern the world through military might. I know, I know, I know. It, it, I'm it, 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 at this point, it seems like even the U.S. elite elite knows her. You know, the world is fucked. They fucked up the world. So what they're gonna do is gonna fucked up the rest of the world even more. So the U.S. by comparison seems to be the island of stability i mean this is like their strategy vis-a-vis europe right now i mean europe is getting i don't know if i can say fucked can they fucked royally over this the 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 russian military operation in ukraine by siding with the united states by posing sanctions and they're doing that just to show their 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 good client states of the u.s but they're they're committing economic suicide but you know what that was actually good for us in u.s companies if not for u.s people it was good for u.s company it means like the you know the u.s is now selling more oil and gas to to, to europe um u.s and even when u.s is getting um like its client states like australia to to um to have worse relationship with china us is us companies selling to china at the expense of the australian companies <laughs> so all the all in all this is this seems to be the us elite strategy right now you know we are we, we are very good our military is very good at screwed up the whole the rest of the world. So we're gonna make sure that the rest of the world are smoking ruins, so that that the money and the capital have to flow to United States. Oh, I mean, uh, as a as a as a as a as a place of refuge. And and and, and if this is not a co, I mean, this is this is on macro level, but but uh, uh, on the individual level, it seems like the different U.S defense companies are they're just out to make money now <laughs> they don't really care about the bigger they may even claim they're for for u.s hegemony whatever but they're, they're just really out there to make money i mean like for example taiwan is a very good reliable source of money for them because every year u.s sells billions of uh, weapons to taiwan and and this weapon platform yeah. even recognized by taiwanese themselves as being will be useless in a war with mainland China. Yeah, because, no, you know, well, yeah, useless. <laughs> because U.S. wants Protect Taiwan to, to... U.S. wants Taiwan, for example, to buy uh, submarine hunting helicopters. It's like... It's like... It's like... It, yeah, you would make sense for you if Taiwan to have submarine uh, hunting helicopter only in case if you, you know, you... Taiwan serves as a subsidiary of the U.S. military to 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 be the U.S. to to watch Chinese submarine for the U.S. military. That's how U.S. military planned for the role of J- Japanese self defense force. For example, you know Japan was not supposed to have a military <laughs> by its constitution, but they got around this issue by calling a self defense force. And now U.S. have structured the, this Japanese self uh, uh, defense force as this like the submarine hunting wing. Of the U.S. Navy. I mean, that's that's how U.S. is seen sees itself as a world. You know, Taiwan is expecting somehow these uh, the, the weapon per- purchase is gonna the, this weapon purchase is not really benefiting Taiwan's defense capability per se. It's always benefiting U.S. It's benefiting the U.S. defense industries in the concrete dollar terms. It's all it's benefiting the U.S. military. By by adding on capability, U.S. is kind of offsourcing this peripheral role to its client states, to, to Taiwan, to 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 Japan in its confrontation with China, and that's where we are. Yeah, yeah. So well, I think we can. Uh, maybe we should. Yeah, I, I need to stay on for a few minutes, do some announcements though. But this was a great. This is a great conversation, guys. Thanks so much for coming on this evening. Um, you know, definitely both of you guys can plug whatever you're doing and shout you if you have any uh, kind of closing 
uh, anything you want to say. But um, yeah, uh, you know, I'll probably stay on for another five, ten more minutes, guys, uh, just to announce a few things. But uh, Xiang Yu and then Carl, if you want to plug whatever uh, you'd like. Okay. Um, closing statements. I love Taiwan. It's my home. I do not want it to be caught in a situation that the people did not ask for in the first place. And um, U.S. imperialism has been, it's like the, it's like the mob. It makes you pay for protection, but the threat is the mob itself. And um, yeah, that's my closing statement. And I guess announcements, I guess if you like what I say, I'm trying to get less into flame wars on Twitter. I can't make any promises, but I'm trying. Um, you can follow me on Twitter at um, not Xiang Yu. That is N O T X I N G the X I A N G Y U. Yes, oh, it's spelled on the bottom. Just add a not. I'm to putting it. the uh, I'm putting it in the chat too. Yeah. So if you guys want to, um, I got um two music videos coming up from my next album. First time actually hiring a professional film team to do it, so it should be exciting. Um, it's better than anything that's um been out before and the, actually the beats for those two songs are made by our mutual good friend uh danny um you know who i'm talking about oh uh, uh mr agent of change the yes. legend agent of change aka carlos martinez yes yes so that should be exciting for all of us or well, for me i don't know about you no guys, i love i mean I, i'm always interested in his beats definitely yeah <laughs> all right so That's this is say, uh, so thanks for listening my plug, my own podcast, Silk and Steel podcast. Um, you know, I focus mostly on China and surrounding regions, the cultural politics and history. And uh, I have been recently doing a chronological retelling of the Chinese history. Currently, we are uh, at 3,000 years <laughs> and uh, we're, we're moving forward. And uh, I'm also have a concurrently I have a series on the Chinese Civil War in the Manchuria Theater um, and, and many more. And I also have a web. Uh, you can find my podcast on Patreon. Just go to Patreon and search Silk. You'll be the first podcast that shows up. Uh, you can also find me on YouTube. I do have a YouTube channel. I have a lot of free content on, on YouTube. Um, uh, Carl Za, I have a lot of debate with uh, China watchers. <laughs> they are now getting a lot of the play infamous. on the mainstream yeah. <laughs> mainstream media. Um, I have uh, I have a very prolific uh, a Twitter account. Just just my name, Carl Za, is my uh, my handle, and uh, you know a lot of shit posting. <laughs> I do sometimes. I put in. Info, informative content <laughs> like Chinese history. <laughs> and I stuff. actually have a series on the history of Taiwan's development. If you're excited, it's like it's like many episodes. I think it's, it's like huge. It's oh, huge, yeah. but it's it's, it's uh, worth it. Start it's like that me for the interesting for that it gets faster paced. The first two episodes, it's like the lead up. Carl is a walking encyclopedia. He so is I, a walking I think, encyclopedia. I think his own series on Chinese history. Like by the time it's finished, I feel like Dr. Dre's own detox will already be out. Um, which never out. So it's because you'll like do 30 minute like um segues like, oh, yeah, um fun fact, this is the Dutch fort design and why it why it made um made things gave um Zheng Chenggong such a hard time. And then he'll explain like the Dutch fort designs in great detail. I was just like, holy shit. Like, wow. Well, I'm a, well, I'm a history nerd. <laughs> yeah, you are. Hey, we, we need it. We need it. Um, I, anyway, I'm going to stay on for another 10 more minutes or so as I have a few announcements. But, guys, thank you. I will be back in touch with you both, I'm sure, very soon. And, uh, yeah, take care. Thanks for taking so much time out. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for inviting us, uh, Danny. You know, anytime. I, I love to talk. <laughs> <laughs> I love so. that you love to talk. <laughs> yeah. All right, guys. All right, peace out. Let's do this again. Yes. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye, Carl. Okay. All right. All right. So thank you all for coming. Uh, keep liking this video. Keep, um, you know, keep uh, hitting the notifications bell, subscribe button. Just have a few announcements for you all before I head out and <laughs> head to bed. Um, it is getting laid out here uh, in the East Coast of the United States, New York. Um so, yeah, that was a great conversation. And I just want to put out my own plug now because every single month we're in a recession. I'm going to call it, guys. We're in a recession. We are in a recession or we are in an economic crisis. I hate the word recession. It really underplays what a capitalist crisis is. But anyway, to the plug. 
So we're in a recession, an economic crisis, and um, I'm independent. I'm completely independent. I am. Uh, uh, I make my income based on readers of my articles, which I publish quite a few, although fewer lately. But um, and, and I'm doing more and more streams here uh, as well. I'm probably going to get on Rockfin. I think I have a meeting tomorrow. So I'm trying to expand this project. Uh, and the best way to help, because I saw people want moderation, people want all kinds of things. And the only way I can get that is by increasing uh, my income on Patreon. So if you guys can go to patreon.com slash Danny Haifong, you know, with this economic crisis, I've noticed of late, you know, losing about 100 to $150 per month every month. And it's kind of like playing catch up, you know. So help keep me sustainable. This is a gig economy. Uh, this is the way that this works now with journalism. Patreon.com slash Danny Haifong or Substack, you know, in the description below. So that's the only plug I had. The only plug I had because I want to spend uh, maybe five or ten more minutes just summarizing what I heard. But um, you can also go to my Telegram at the Haifong Press where my Patreon is linked. Um, I put that in, it's in the description as well. In my link tree, you can subscribe there uh, for all content updates for free. You know, nothing is behind a paywall. I don't paywall any of my work. Um, it's just that, yeah, I, I do, uh, in order to build up this channel, I want it to be bigger. You know, I've noticed that people are thirsty for this. People want this. And, and um, with China and with these kind of issues, you know, there aren't a lot of voices out there willing to have these conversations and to have them in the way that I have them, which is with an eye toward peace, an eye toward anti-imperialism, an eye toward socialism, and not playing this game as if we cannot take sides in what is a class struggle globally and what is a vast changing, a fast changing world where empire, American empire is at the center. So that's my work. So please do, you know, help out if you can, you know, in any way that you can. And I really appreciate that. But with that said, I just want to summarize sort of uh, one point that I just want to make that you all can take away from this. And that is you heard about the history of Taiwan. You heard about the history of cross straits relations. You heard about the U.S.'s role and in interference in Taiwan, the broader region, this new Cold War, this aggression, Right. And I want to make one final point from my perspective, from the perspective of me as a socialist, as a communist, as someone who considers themselves to be in a working class struggle. We should look at this. We should look at this issue right now um, in the following way. If Nancy Pelosi touching down in Taiwan leads to China. Uh, intervening militarily, which I think it will. I think China will take some military response. What that will be, it's unclear. I do think it'll be measured, and I do think it'll fall on the United States side to escalate it. That's my opinion. That's what I. That's just based on behavior of how China has reacted uh, over the course of many decades, but especially right now in the past five or so years, where this new Cold War has exploded. Right. In the last five to 10 years, it has exploded and China has been very patient, has been willing to take only very measured responses, if any at all, and continue to look forward. And one of the ways that that has given China an, an advantage is the following. China has increased its military spending, as it should when there is a direct threat to its sovereignty and literal security right at its borders, right across, right in its seas, right in its waters, right in its airspace. There is a threat that is the biggest threat to humanity that maybe humanity has ever seen. And I think, you know, that is not necessarily hyperbole. The United States has a long history of terrorism, genocide, slavery, endless war, right? The, it, just example after example of killing, killing, killing. What did Donald Trump say? The United States, we're killers too. The United States' is military, the United States' is system of imperialism, it's murderous. It's dangerous. And so China has increased its military, but it, and it has a modern military. It is not necessarily at a disadvantage. I think that there are some people who have so much hubris, so much American exceptionalism, so much uh, uh, ingrained anti-China racism, and just, uh, it's just racism and prejudice in general, that they truly do think China is weak. 
They view China as if China was in a such it was in 1840, 1840s, uh, you know, opium, first opium war, second opium war. They view China in that lens, right? Set during the century of humiliation. No more, guys. No more. China has a modern military, sophisticated military. It has 1.4 billion people, all of whom, not just the 95% who support the government, everybody except maybe a tiny fraction of liberals, what they call liberals over there, neoliberals, tiny fraction. Can't even really see them when you think about the entire political situation in China. You have more than 98 Eight percent, if not a, a close to 100 percent of people united in defending China's sovereignty, whatever people's definition of that is. Right. But for the most part, that is People's Republic of China, China's socialist market economy. That's what is being defended. You have 98 plus percent of people willing to defend that. So that's on top of the PLA. So you and you also have a prosperous economy, a prosperous socialist oriented market economy which is prospering and stable it doesn't have the inflation crisis it doesn't even have recessions it doesn't have economic crises this is just facts it, china's economy has not had an economic crisis it's had cra- it, i mean during the uh, sanctions against it uh, during the great leap forward etc there were crises of its own kind but not of the degree of what an economic crisis looks like in terms of the cycle of capitalism doesn't have that. So you have China in this position right now in the United States in its own kind of position. As I stated, can't win any wars, can't keep any stability abroad in its militarism. Politically, completely illegitimate. Joe Biden's approval rating is, what, 30%? That's not going to get better with a war with China. It won't. Then you also have the economic crisis. You do have a, either a looming recession or it's already happening. Who knows? There's all these debates. But nonetheless, it feels like an economic crisis for the vast majority of people. That's not even to say black people, working class people, uh, the vast majority are feeling an economic crisis harder than they have already been feeling it during this peer post-2007-2008 period post pandemic uh, I'm not going to say post pandemic but post pandemic economic crisis right uh, people are feeling it so with all of that all of the divisions all of the issues that you, the US is is dealing with it's obvious that Nancy Pelosi's stunt is a response to this it's also it, it's a response to this but it's a terrible miscalculation so when you have Hu Jin of Global Times, the editor. Follow him on Twitter, guys, because it is absolutely incredible what he how he has been talking. The Global Times in general, I read it on Colin and op-ed. They are literally outlining what the People's Liberation Army will do. This is not secret information. This is not China hiding things. No. China is being very, very, very clear. And we have to take a side. And to be honest, China has every single right to respond to threats to its sovereignty, just like Russia does, just like Syria does, just like Cuba does, just like any country under threat from U.S. imperialism has the right to respond. Now, there are certain times where you can't. There are certain times where it's not possible. There are certain times where the best thing that you can do is keep, uh, what, what did China used to say? Hide your capabilities, bide your time. That's what a lot of countries are forced to do. Some have to fight. And if China feels like it has to fight back, it will fight back. Why wouldn't it? How could it not? Do you see where Taiwan is located? <laughs> Do you see what is happening on the so-called first island chain that the United States has been building up around? It's war. The United States is at a war. Now, it's not the kind of war uh, that you would I- imagine in your head a la Iraq, right? That's not the war that this is. This is a new Cold War. And new in cold wars, if you remember the first, always lead to hot wars. This time, the hot wars are incredibly dangerous because it's leading to an actual military confrontation with the big powers. And we have to take a side. And I don't care what anyone says. I don't care about any detractors in the United States, whether it's in the political class, whether it's establishment, whether it's just people who are propagandized. 
I believe firmly that we need to stand resolutely on the side of China in this matter. And I don't, whatever you think about China, it doesn't matter. China's following international law. It's abiding by longstanding agreements with the United States. You have to stand by that at the very minimum, given the broad array of forces at play and the general situation, which really is a general crisis of capitalism, the general crisis of imperialism. So really, at this point, with all the people who have come to me and said, you're a CP, CCP agent and shill and Wu Mao and all this nonsense, all the hate that we get, that I especially get for my focus on China, not that I ever really cared, but at this point, the stakes are so high that really all these kind of forces, all these folks who are so ingratiated in the foreign policy establishment will just will just digest and ingest the vile, the 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 bile, the literal racist bile of the U.S. ruling class against China, Russia, whatever. Now the stakes are so high where we cannot afford to pay attention to these kind of forces. We cannot afford to get caught up with unserious people who are not ready to stand for peace. We have to move resolutely. We have to move quickly. We have to stand on the right side of history. And if China's on the right side of history, then we stand with China. If Russia's on the right side of history, we stand with Russia. If Syria's on the right side of history, we stand with Syria. If Cuba's on the right side of history, we stand with Cuba. If Nicaragua's on the right side of history, we stand with Nicaragua. Venezuela is on the right side of history. We stand with Venezuela. We can go on and on and on and on and on, but you get my point. The fear that the U.S. empire and its propaganda apparatus places upon us is the problem. It's fear. It's racism. It's jingoism. It's chauvinism. We got to drop that. We have to, as I said, what Lenin taught us is you turn imperialist wars into class wars, into civil wars. We have a war happening right now. Look at what happened to the Afri Africa, um, socialist, uh, African People's Socialist Party, the AASP, uh, uh, APSP, uh, Omali Eshetela, the chairman. Look what happened to them. St. Louis, Florida, they were raided by the FBI, McCarthyism. Uh, look what's happening with Julian Assange. Look what's happening with political prisoners. Look what's happening right here, you know, on and on and on. Look what's happening to us on these platforms. Look what's happening. The war is here. The corporations are our enemy. The military industrial complex are our enemy. Wall Street is our enemy. China is not our enemy. In fact, just as I think Russia is our friend, in uh, almost, uh, you know, for the most part in the aggregate, China is, in my opinion, our friend. China is pursuing peace. It's pursuing a model of development. It's pursuing things that we should look at and look toward. We should learn from. We should not adopt the belligerence of this empire because look where it's getting us. Nancy Pelosi with her Twenty thousand plus do uh, dollar refrigerator with her hundred million dollar net worth, with her uh, insider, uh, uh, you know, stocks, her her stock trading, all of that. Look where it's getting us. That's our enemy. Whoever is in the establishment, the entire establishment, their willingness to get us where we are at right now, is the reason why they are our enemy. This is a class war. This is a war against this elite that is trying to hold on to an empire that has long become outmoded. They're trying to hold on to a capitalist system that has long become outmoded, that has long become irrelevant. We don't need a capitalist system anymore. The wealth is here. The development is here. There's no scarcity. There's only imposed scarcity. There's only, there's only ruling elites, there's only corporations, monopolies, financiers who are imposing scarcity upon the majority. There is no scarcity. They're imposing white supremacy, racism, fascism, neo-Nazism, neo all of this. They're imposing this upon us. This is their war on us. This is not China's war on us. China is fighting for its sovereignty. 
We don't need any of this. This isn't helping us. This isn't going to reduce inflation. This isn't going to get us housing. This is going to get us student let, don't, uh, debt forgiveness. This isn't going to get us uh, the so-called police reform or what we should be saying. This isn't going to get us community control of the police. This isn't going to bring back the thousands upon thousands of people, the thousands of black people, the thousands upon thousands of uh, people of all nationalities who have been killed by the police. This isn't going to free the more than the two million prisoners who deserve to be free. This isn't going to do any of that. This isn't going to get rid of mass incarceration. It's not going to get rid of the contradictions of the empire by blaming China. We have to wage our own class war. We have to be able to understand the situation. So I'm grateful for all of you for coming out tonight to uh, get a more of a grasp on this particular question. This particular question. So with that said, everyone, it is late. It's 12, 15 a.m. where I'm sitting. I'm actually going to be doing more of these later. I heard someone out there say, oh, you should get guests on call. And I'm trying, guys. It's hard. Scheduling takes a lot of time. Um, going through some transitions right now. My wife's working overnights now. Uh, you know. <laughs> so, But I'm going to be doing more late streams because of that. Plus, I got con I'm also doing some tenant organizing in my building because we got construction coming literally right next door and i live on the wing of the building where it's going to be right there so my day times are probably not going to be good times to stream anymore to be honest so i'm going to be doing more late night stuff so be ready for that uh make sure you subscribe and, and hit the notifications bell so you know when i'm on but you know part of this is i'm also going to be doing some more tenant organizing stuff because that is a problem not just for my quality of life for also the quality of life here we also had some other issues going on so I'm going to try to get involved in that way because I'm fed up. I can't live like this anymore, guys. When I see a problem, it's like I got to do something about it. This is where I live. And, um, you know, uh, 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 anyway, point is, is just make sure you subscribe here. Make sure you're following me. Make sure you're hitting that Telegram subscription, you know, going to the link tree, subscribe to the Telegram. And, of course, as I said before, Patreon, you know, I'm trying to uh, uh, build back up. Uh, after another beginning of the month where the economic crisis is very real for people. So I'm not here saying do it, you know, because uh, if you can't, but if you can, you know, this is how you support independent media. This is the tools that we're dealt with. Um, and I would appreciate any kind of support in that way. With that said, everybody, uh, and thanks, Black Queer Socialista. socialista um, I'm going to try to, um, I need to hit up some people about what it means to do this because I've never actually done tenant. I've done union. Um, it's just a different feel. And I've been out of the organizing grind for a little bit because of the media, the pandemic, the media work I've been doing. Um, so I've got to get back into it um, and get help. But anyway, everyone, thanks so much. Uh, please, you know, as you're on the way out, like, um, like the video, subscribe, hit the notifications bell, and of course, hit that link tree up. And uh, uh, <laughs> said, yes, everyone have a good night if it's nighttime for you. Uh, I won't be getting that much of a good sleep because my um, my dog's gonna wake me up in like six hours and uh, I'll try uh, I'll try to go back to bed. It's hard though. Uh, with that said, um, yeah, Felix, thanks so much. That's so true. Yeah, 600 viewers. I mean, I think some of that was the guests. But look, um, I'm hoping that, you know, streaming at this time will be more a little more lucrative for me. Um, anyway, take care, everyone. Uh, I will be back with you again soon. If there's updates tomorrow, I don't know if I'll be able to hold back. I might have to come back on. All right. Peace out.